Ras ras.
Раз, раз. Раз, раз, раз. Раз, два, три. Раз. Раз, раз, два, три. Раз, раз, два, три. Секундочку. Так, вот Лазер тоже есть. Подождите секундочку. Так. Так, а. Вот, лазер вот этот, вот этот красненький. Вот эта вот эта кнопочка вверх. Да. Вот это да, верхняя. Немножко ниже. Вот. Окей. Пожалуйста, вот петличку, петличку, если можно. Вот, наверное, вам вот так удобно. Куда-нибудь или в карман, или... Когда вам куда-нибудь можно поставить? Okay, uh, let, uh, let me first uh, thank the organizers, both international and Armenian ones, especially Professor Rema Rufini for inviting me to, to, to present a talk at, at this very interesting meeting. So I shall speak about inflation. Inflation, uh, so... Um, about something uh, which was in, in the remote past of, of 
of the history of, of our uh, universe. Uh, so, ah, okay, so um, so uh, but, uh, so my uh, talk will be uh, mostly uh, phenomenological ones. So uh, the, to, uh, I shall present some uh, models which have direct relation with observational data, leaving uh, attempts to discuss what is the nature of the object, in particular what is the nature of the infoton itself to, uh, to uh, further research. So uh, uh, first I shall present you what are the simplest, uh, 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 simplest inflationary models, and I shall count simplicity, I would say, in, at the arithmetical level, or, or in other words, in the um, uh, logical level, by the number of, uh, of parameters in these models, which cannot be, which cannot be derived from uh, any figure, but have to be taken from observations only. And, and so at the present state, state of the art, the simplest models are, are one para, para metric, but then um, uh, 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 progressing the developments in the inflation are mainly um, about the process which occurs either, either after inflation. And that's why I shall, I shall present some, uh, some uh, my recent paper in the adding um, some um, uh, 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 process of which it generates barren asymmetry after the, after the end of one of the simplest models, one of the simplest inflationary models, the R1. And, and then uh, just the, I shall try to go in just the, the opposite direction on time. And um, just because inflation, uh, uh, not inflation in a very general sense, but inflation inside our past light cone was only a finite stage. And, and so uh, there was something before, and, and, I shall, and I shall say a few words about it. About it. So it's possible there at present we don't have any observation data that regarding what, what, what was before inflation. Still, it still is interesting to think about it. Okay, so uh, this is the um, picture of the, uh, I would say, standard paradigm of modern cosmology about the known part of the history of, uh, of our uh, universe, you know, in which you can see the four main stages, inflation, then hot, uh, hot Big Bang, then uh, 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 otherwise we call this radiation dominated stage, then the meta dominated stage, and then now Entering the uh, first, the first stage, the uh, stage um, driven, driven by that energy, uh, and uh, st still I, I prefer instead of this of this of this picture, I prefer uh, to, to present the same in the form of in the form of letters, in the form of letters and equations, and so all all the present. All, mm, all the picture in the present slide can be um, at right here as uh, the history as the history as the known part of the history of, of our universe in one line so in one line and so here once more you see the four for this main ep epochs uh, first this is the stage of Friedman millimeter Robinson Walker radiation that dominated stage, then the three limit of Robertson Walker uh, method dominated stage, and we are now entering the second dissertic stage, which from the qualitative point of view is remarkably similar to the first dissertic stage, though of course actual values of curvature are fantastically, uh, fantastically less. Okay, so this is the, once more, as I said, the history of, of the universe in one line, and this is explanation of these letters, first in terms of 
geometrie, het wordt dus karakteristiek begrepen over de Hubble factor at each stage. En zo hier zie je scouten van de end of inflationary stage. Zo in terms of scale factor, this corresponds to t in power one half and t in power two. To search, and once more you see the uh, uh, remarkable similarity of the, of the first and fourth stages. And the second line, so this is geometry and, and this is physics. So, uh, uh, following the Einstein idea that um, uh, geometry is uh, uh, determined by, by physics and vice versa. And so, uh, this, uh, this is what is the exact effective equation. Uh, Total equation of state of matter, which is which is needed to 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 produce this expansion law. So in the first and the first stage, it is something which looks like approximately as a as a cosmological constant, and here and here it is a, a, this radiation and or other other relativistic plasma, and and here it is a, it is. A, um, It is uh, dust like dust like matter, and uh, what does we know about du du duration of its stages? Uh, just um, though it's usually people speak about duration in cosmic time uh, for uh, many uh, reasons, and it's it's simpler and uh, it is also uh, useful for when speaking about perturbations in the terms of so-called the delta n. Formalism is better to speak about duration of this stage in terms of the number of three folds, and in this one, this is the shorter stage. So that this this was longer, even more longer, and this was the longest stage. But we don't know its uh, its uh, total due due iteration, but that's, uh, but my statement that it is finite. This thing once more inside our past light cone, and what we can directly observe of directly see from our observations, and uh, see uh, is, is that very simply, without a, a comp a com a complicated computer programs, but using all, only bare bare eyes, is is the difference of the number of defaults in different points points of space. Okay, and this is the actual. Uh, Uh, this is the picture of the of the uh, angular temperature and this is P and actually I shall I shall return to, to this picture but uh, mostly people uh, skip uh, uh, go to the next uh, to uh, graphics to, uh, which uh, which present expansion expansion of this picture into, into um, uh, uh, spherical uh, harmonics. And this is the uh, observational, observational result, uh, just the uh, latest um, uh, Palanc results. Okay, and uh, uh, the red line, though uh, you see that the curve itself, the, the curve itself is very, it's very complicated. It is, it is remarkable that it can be it's very well reproduced, but As I said, uh, it only uh, using only one uh, three parameter, and you see this excellent agreement. Actually, the same picture now for emote for polarization multiples, and there exists also a third picture uh, which I skipped for variety on the correlation between anisotropy and polarization, and actually also uh, the result. The uh, result, which usually is presented, it goes without saying, but actually it's very non-trivial. It's non-trivial result that we see um, that we see only one half of possible of possible linear polarization. That we see E mode, but we don't see B mode, and that there is indeed uh, indeed a very non-trivial result because nothing. A similar curves in the case of of radiation by say by cosmic dust. So it's easy. and it follows one more. It follows one more from the uh, trivial non-trivial prediction of inflation, but 
prohibition are suppressed as compared, as compared to stellar ones. Uh, I would say once more, though it usually goes uh, as the initial, but I would say that speaking, remembering what was said about 40 years ago, said what initially was singularity, um, uh, space-time fall, uh, this is what uh, Stephen Hawking said, uh, space-time space, uh, form, uh, something like one um, uh, virtual Planck mass black hole inside any Planck volumes. So speaking at this level, it, it, it would be really uh, it's very strange why, uh, why tender perturbations from this space uh, space time form are, are, are suppressed and in fact it's very soon suppressed. Okay, and so now I'm speaking about inflation. So uh, uh, I shall use inflation, the word inflation in the in the narrow sense, in, in the narrow, in this, because it is always used in a very, in a, in a, in a very wide sense, and this results in some, in some things. So I, I shall speak um, in this narrow inflation, uh, which can be called uh, cold inflation. In fact, it's, uh, it, it is based on two independent hypothesis, where it's they were usually presented as one hypothesis. I want to emphasize that we got two independent hypotheses. The first hypothesis prefers uh, the background is the existence, the, uh, the hypothesis about the very existence of inflation, or better to say, a quasi discipline stage, a stage of, of accelerated close to exponential expansion of our of our the universe, and the second hypothesis is, uh, is, is regarding perturbations, that the origin of perturbations is just to be suppressed, in, in not any, any other effect, gravitational chaos of pairs and particles, uh, and, and, uh, and field fluctuations from, from the rich emission states for a gigabatic vacuum or no particle state for uh, um, for uh, Fourier modes capturing all observable range of scales. And why uh, this hypothesis are in fact independent, it uh, uh, follows from the simple fact that there exist, uh, uh, there exist rivals of inflation. Inflation is scenario, the alternative theories which um, uh, uh, reject and even often uh, often very, uh, very frantically reject uh, one of these hypotheses, but accept another one. In, in, partic in particular, the so-called ectorotic uh, scenario, they uh, reject the first hypothesis, but assume the second one, just the opposite, the so-called class of models called warm inflation, just the opposite, that they assume if it's hypothesis about use, come out completely different scenario, um, completely different mechanism for a generation of perturbations. And, that, and uh, from my point of view, uh, no, of course, uh, this is uh, both a hypothesis, but I want to emphasize that they are, they are, I would say they are natural because they exist <laughs> analogs in the other areas of physics because the analog of this hypothesis is just the is just the process of the present dark energy and in the theory of this effect it can fact that especially uh, uh, following the lines of the I, I would say almost absurd effect of uh, creation of electrons and positrons in the external strong electromagnetic fields. From the observational point of view, it has uh, what, uh, uh, what we need from any inflationary models is their prediction for primordial spectra, the spectra at the end of inflation, or better, the better to say, in the super Hubble, in the super Hubble uh, region, uh, region for each mode. And then it, it appears that the metric it can be always uh, 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 can be represented in in some gauge, uh, uh, which is actually a symptom of uh, uh, gauge. There are some additional conditions to make it 
uh, uh, not rigorously defined, but, but actually these quantities in this expression are actually coincide with the, the, the so-called uh, uh, locally gauge in the end quantities. And so uh, the statement is that though it's uh, this, uh, this is a presentation for one uh, uh, free, free, uh, free modes of perturbations uh, uh, where, exist, where exist other modes of perturbations, but there always exists one scalar mode uh, and two uh, tenter modes in, this, this, in which these quantities are, are, are approximately time independent in this regime. And this is, and this is a rigorous uh, mat mathematical statement uh, following simply from the existence of the um, uh, uh, homogeneous, from the exact, exact homogeneous uh, existence in any theory of, of, of gravity, uh, not, not specifically in, in the Einstein man, uh, to the only condition where uh, this uh, isotropic homogeneous uh, solution is not degenerate in the mathematical sense, in the sense that where exists uh, arbitrary small, uh, another generic illusions which can be arbitrary uh, close to this one. Okay, and that were the most interesting, so uh, the most interesting quantity are the, it just the, uh, for the power spectrum of scalar perturbations, it's, it's slope for which for purely historical reasons is denoted not simply by ns, but by ns minus, minus one, it's simply a notation, uh, not, uh, nothing deep in it. And the, and the ratio of the of the squares of the, of, of these quantities, prime module, prime module detected gravitational waves to, uh, to, to to prime, to prime module scalar, scalar perturbations. Okay, and what we see from observations, once more, though in general, that these functions with some arbitrary functions of the, of the, of the vector, uh, uh, the, uh, all observational, all, all observational, uh, observational results which I presented at that pop, pop, for previous slides can be can be compressed in fact into numbers into two numbers that this uh, that this quantity defined in this way is uh, is um, uh, very uh, weakly depends on scale uh, and we have two new constants two uh, uh, I would say two new observational fundamental constants of cosmology this one the amplitude of a power spectrum and its slope, which is small. And from the meteorological point of view, uh, in all inflationary models, and actually non-inflationary model, uh, models too, uh, this, this constant uh, has probably taken from observations only, but this, uh, uh, this quantity can be derived in the simplest models, uh, uh, which I shall present in the, in the next slide, and I'm eating some, uh, some long but small corrections, about 10 percent, the, the predictions is very simple. The uh, first predictions, prediction of this quantity, uh, which is some new number, in which form the uh, uh, finally, as I said, up to about 10 percent corrections, it is finally uh, expressed, it is finally that related to, to this quantity, uh, which simply shows how large is the present universe, because what enters here are the present uh, CMB temperature and the present Hubble constant and, and uh, Boltzmann constant and, and one constant. And, the, and once more, I'm eating this complicated but small, small, uh, less than 10 percent corrections where the predictions at which you can uh, see which you can check by your own eyes is simply that models of this quantity multiplied by uh, this one is 
approxim approximately true. Okay, so uh, there, of course there are this more co complicated inflationary models which have, according to my definition of uh, simplicity or, or complexity, which depends on more or on a larger number of arbitrary of, of uh, some uh, uh, terminological uh, parameters, but in polis models, we cannot make definite prediction about expected amount of, of, prim of primordial gravitational waves. Uh, there are these three models uh, which produce nothing predictions, in particular, this is also my other ad 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 R, R plus R squared model. And then, uh, as I said, uh, this one parameter is fixed by the, just uh, by uh, this first, uh, by uh, this first constant, after it is completely defined, and then uh, this parameter, uh, which is actually mass of the effective scalar degree of freedom, a kind of gravitational, gravitational plasmon. Uh, so it, it is probably at least one, and it is just produce the, uh, required value for this quantity, and the target prediction, target prediction for, for R. Then another, another model is if we have scalar field which has at large value, which has, has, has like the behavior, behavior, but not, so it's not simply Higgs. It, it's Higgs with very strong coupling to um, uh, to uh, gravity with negative coupling by uh, negative I mean, opposing opposing to the sign of conforming coupling, and actually, as you will see in the next slide, this uh, this psi should be of the order of about uh, for uh, uh, 25 hundred. Okay, and so, so the first. It that was proposed by Spacuini, but, but then it, uh, this model acquired much interest because then uh, 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 Sosek Shapishnikov um, uh, uh, proposed that, that, that the scala is actually very Higgs boson. And the third model is the mixed R squared Higgs model, uh, which has, in some sense, it has both R plus R squared term and this, and this Higgs like, like term. Once more, the statement is that the predictions are the same, the only is the renormalized uh, scalar mass of this one. So why this three models in which you, you can say, of course, that the nature of the, uh, of the inflow term, which is called scalar in this model, is very, is very different. Actually, uh, why they, uh, from the phenomenological uh, point of view, they produce the same predictions? The answer is, the effect, it appears that inflation itself in this model is actually the same, because we have the effect uh, which can be called geometrization of scalar, and because it, it appears for, that for a gen generic family of solutions doing inflation, the uh, phi is the files algebraically related to the richest scala. Okay, so uh, modern trends, as I said, ex exclusion of more, uh, of more inflationary models, uh, which were once popular, were uh, using better and better upper, upper bound on the, uh, on, on the parameter R. When the uh, second, Second area in which I don't have them to suspect, but uh, actually I have papers in this area too. Development of more complicated inflation models in which the primordial spectrum of perturbations are not approximately flat, approximately scale three, but actually have a localized speed. Because with the aim, to be prepared, to be prepared for possible discovery of primordial black holes and or peaks in the primordial gravitational wave power spectrum. But, uh, so 
it's possible, but my only comment that this each each of these models uh, requires introduction of at least two in you. Uh, fundamental technological parameters. Then more detailed description of post intellectual evolution. And finally, as I said, uh, what about pre inflationary history? Okay, so the, uh, most, the most recent, and this is the most upper uh, limit on the, on the parameter R, uh, which becomes approximately twice less during the last uh, three. Three, three years, and this is all, all already sufficient to exclude a very popular class of so-called chaotic inflation models. So uh, the, all, all these models um, produce a large amount of primordial gravitational, gravitational waves. But still, uh, still we have, I would say, enough, enough the viable value inflation models, and in particular, as I said, was both all three simplest ones, parametric models, they have target prediction, a target for a future investigation, which, which you see, so speaking about squares of the, of the amplitude, which approximately seven times less, so approximately two point, um, 2.7 times uh, less in amplitude. Oh, okay, so now uh, a few words, uh, because I don't have, uh, have time, a few words in particular, but what can be done? Uh, I, I have to, I need this. <laughs> well, okay, uh, so um, it's possible to add to the, to that one of the simplest unsquared inflationary models. It's, possible to add some uh, mechanisms which produce billion asymmetry, and it's made in the so-called, in the so-called, so according uh, of left uh, genesis scenario. Uh, and then uh, we uh, add uh, 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 much of right hand, uh, uh, right hand at Maya, uh, neutrinos, and then uh, one has to be compared with the k trace of scalarans, of scalarans, the, um, this scalar degree of uh, freedom in the R plus R squared models into, into scalar particles, the Higgs particles, in particular, both uh, uh, minimally and conformally, and conformally coupled, then uh, compared to the, to the k trace to, uh, of Mayagana neutrinos, and then also it's possible uh, for scattering to, to bridge bosons, but it like, uh, occurs due to the tri, tri uh, angle of trace anomaly. So uh, uh, here, uh, what, is, uh, what said it, it is here is the, is the, is the better function. So, so this, uh, uh, this and uh, and that is that expression occurs at the perturbative level. And this, okay, and this is all, all already due to um, one, one loop, a quantum, a quantum, a quantum correction. And actually, in the, in the season papers, yes, okay, in this very, very recent paper, we have considered in two cases, minimal coupling and conformal, conformal coupling. So in the former case, uh, this is the preheating temperature, and, there is, uh, and the results are practically independent of the, of the Mayagana mass. Uh, but in the, in the case of conformal coupling, then uh, just the opposite um, effect occurs. So uh, we have, and as a, as a as a result, we have lower reheating temperature, but, 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 but actually a much, a much more, a much more billion asymmetry. Okay, and so uh, let me only uh, mention some, only mention at the end of my talk. Okay, uh, then, uh, as I said, that we, that we due, due, due duration of the inflationary stage is 
is finite inside our particleite cone. And this is follows from the so-called delta n, delta n formalism, uh, that actually the observed the, this quantity, which can be really observed, as I showed you in the next, in the next slide, it, it, it's, it's very simply to, uh, it's very simply related to the total amount of inflation in different points of space, actually, at the, at the last scattering, at, at, at the last scattering surface. And actually, there exist in this four sufficiently low, for sufficiently low multiples for, for angles, for angles uh, 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 less than 50, then uh, neg 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 neglecting the silk and duplex effect, as well as integrated sexual effects. It appears that the T over T is equal, just equal to minus Y, minus one five. I just want to emphasize this minus because uh, because usually people speak about this quantity square and then uh, this, uh, this, this minus disappears. So in terms, so uh, I saw, in terms for this picture, it, it means that large oceans, sufficiently large oceans, in this picture just corresponds to the places that inflation occurred a little bit longer. It's just the opposite. Large mountains, large mountains corresponds to the places when it occurred, uh, occurred um, uh, a little bit slow. Okay, yes, sir. And how much? And how much shorter? Then it appears there that you can really speak about the, you can uh, uh, really see some um, you can really speak about prolonged time intervals because uh, what is a model independent that uh, looking at the actual actual value of this of this the data um, the data t all the t we really see we really see differences in the number of efforts during during inflation of the soda and in the simplest models in which you do not introduce any new parameters not yet found by observations for which, as I said, the equality during the observable part of this inflation was of this, uh -huh, of this, of this, of this order. That when it, that, that we really see that the duration of inflation in terms of cosmic type was only a little bit larger than the, than the plant time. So that you can immediately ask how how <laughs> how can I speak about Planck time intervals? Because I'm speaking about effects average, effect average on the at large um, at large space interval, which at the end of inflation is of the order of one of one meter, and what it contains it contains more than ten in power one hundred. Uh, at Hubble volumes. And so really, in, in terms of this average quantity, average quantity, just in the same sense as we are, as we are actually measuring, uh, we are speaking about measuring the shifts between the gravitational wave antenna, uh, 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 distances five orders, five and more orders of of, of my, my, my limited less than uh, than the proton size. Just in the sense that we can really see that speaking about this average quantity, we can uh, we see sometimes intervals close to the Planck one. Okay, then let me skip. Uh, let me only show you my conclusions. Okay, and then I stop. So okay, so conclusions of. So then, speaking about uh, observations, we can uh, really, uh, what are definite predictions, uh, actually, uh, for viable inflationary models, we can uh, have different predictions that uh, this quantity is small, and of the order of this quantity, uh, let me once more remind you that this quantity only uh, refers to the, to the, to the 
Prague is a Prague is a universe and so how 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 large is the present universe and when R does not exceed with this quantity back are confirmed, then in the minimal models in which you do not assume, as I said, additional small parameters not found in observations, it appears that during inflation you have, during the observable part of inflation, you have um, uh, this, uh, this curvature, uh, which is large, but still five, about five orders of negative plus than one, 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 then and the characteristic mass of the scalar or of this order, then, as I said, in the simplest, in the pre, pre simplest models, you have uh, definite target, target predictions for, uh, for, for R, uh, which is the same for Pagin models, the actual, the actual uh, the values of of capital M are slightly, slightly different because they depend on the process which occurs after inflation. Then, as I said, this R plus R squared model can be supplemented by a realistic adapter Chinese's scenario. And then, as I said, that we can really see the difference of duration of inflation you said inside our past life life cone um, at the, at, for, from the last scale 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 structure and only the oh, I don't have to spend, to spend the, what was before I would say that the two simplest and most conservative alternatives are either quasi exotropic bounds due to positive scalar curvature in some finite region of space or to make as a topic as a topic singularity that the curvature much exceeding that during the observable part of inflation. I'll, I'll thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So if uh, if you have any questions or comments, I think we can talk in mm -hmm. private, okay. Okay. And our next speaker will be Lorenzo Amati. No, no, okay. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, no. This one? No. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, once more, it's an it's a it's a rather old old uh, scenario. As I said, as I said, it was uh, yes, yes, yes. And the and when the the simple question. Uh, why a uh, 10 in power uh, 13? It follows uh, from the from the, the system mechanism. So the statement is that this mass this mass uh, multiplied the large the mass the uh, mass of the uh, hazardous of the hazardous neutrino. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, no. Of course, of course, it's not, it's not the only possible, possible scenario. But as I said, once more. Yeah, yeah. No, but no. The, the simple check. As I said, that this mass 
в мультиплекле не ты на нас из детства скве ове скве ове 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 more or less they come to the earth with a ray from 2.23 per day although they are detected with a lower ray because of course of the inefficiencies of the satellites they come mostly into flavors based on duration distribution so short gamma ray burst lasting from a few milliseconds up to one two seconds and long gamma ray burst lasting from um, a couple of seconds up to several minutes or even more and uh, of which is also most important for the cosmological exploitation of gamma ray burst the burst itself as you can see on the bottom right is followed by a multi-wavelength fading emission which is called the afterglow uh, which can be detected uh, from the x-ray to the radio near infrared optical and so on so uh, thanks to the efforts uh, observational and theoretical efforts uh, in the last 20 25 years uh, we now have uh, discovered, first of all, 25 years ago, uh, the uh, eventually the distance scale to gamma ray burst. Uh, you can see on the top uh, left uh, here the Rashi distribution. The gray one is the for long gamma ray bursts, so they can be detected long ones up to Rashi more than uh, eight or nine, which means a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Uh, and uh, they are thought to be produced by the core collapse, I mean, this is the standard scenario, of course, uh, you, uh, you heard much more from uh, Remo and his colleagues, uh, but the standard scenario is that they are in any way associated with the core collapse of very massive stars, uh, whereas for short gamma ray burst, uh, uh, the main scenario, at least most of them are produced by the new magic of neutral star, neutral star, neutral star black hole systems. Uh, so the very the distribution to very high redshift of gamma ray burst of long gamma ray burst uh, the huge luminosity in the gamma rays that make them detectable up to these very large distances uh, and their association with the massive the death of uh, very massive stars make them very interesting for cosmology and the investigation aimed at a full exploiting gamma ray burst for cosmology uh follow basically two lines of research the first one is to use them as uh, beacons uh, for the um, first stars first galaxy in the universe so as i just shown uh, they can be detected up to the so-called cosmic dawn uh, when first stars were first galaxies were forming so this is right the epoch which is now being explored uh, uh with the jwst so i will show gamma ray boss can provide uh, uh, even much more information and the other line of research is to uh, exploit them to measure uh, the cosmological parameters so let me start focusing uh, on the use of gamma ray burst for exploring the early universe this is uh, you can see in this picture uh, putting gamma ray burst in the cosmological context and as i just mentioned thanks to their huge luminosity and Rashi distribution they bridge our knowledge up to the so-called epoch of the cosmic dawn so we know after recombination 
at a ratio of 1000 and 100, more or less, the universe started to be composed mostly by neutral hydrogen, so it was mostly dark. Um, after a few tens million years after the Big Bang, first stars, first galaxies start to form. Uh, and so uh, after one, 200 million years after the Big Bang, uh, the ultraviolet photos produced by the first stars start to reunite the intergalactic medium. So it, 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 we have the start of the so-called reionization epoch. And so we have nowadays uh, the universe, which is mostly ionized. Uh, and this is the epoch, which is called the Cosmic Dawn. So the epoch, again, where first stars, first galaxies were forming, and which is now being beautifully explored by the JWST, but still with strong limitations that I will discuss in a while. So just to give you a flavor of uh, uh, the high power of gamma ray burst uh, for these uh, uh, investigations, you can see what you can see on the bottom left uh, is the near infrared after so the image of the near infrared afterglow following a gamma ray burst at a ratio of 9.2 9.4 which is the higher ratio of gamma ray burst which means four four five hundred million years after the big bang so it is true that as i mentioned at this very early epoch uh, hst the Hubble space telescope already detected in the previous years a few very bright galaxies um, also through gravitational lensing and now JWST is unveiling a population of bright galaxies there. But this is, uh, uh, thanks to gamma ray burst, what you see here is the signature of the explosion of a star in, at this very early epoch. So there is no other means uh, to be so, uh, so impressive that we can detect exploding stars. We can detect directly stars um, a few hundred million years after the event at the so-called cosmic dawn, when they're forming the first population of stars and galaxies. So if we could get a statistical sample of tens or 100 um, high ratio gamma ray burst at a ratio of six or more, so ratio of six corresponds more or less to the first billion years of the universe, we could, for instance, as you can see on the right, uh, provide a fundamental contribution to assessing the star formation rate evolution at this very early epoch, as you can see uh, through the blue and gray uh, regions here, the uncertainty in the star formation rate evolution is larger and larger as you go to a ratio of six, seven, eight. And this is because, again, both uh, Hubble Space Telescope and nowadays also JWST uh, are limited to detecting the brightest uh, primordial galaxies, whereas the bulk of star formation in this very epoch is uh, reasonably thought to be in low luminosity, low mass galaxies. And the main properties of gamma ray burst, uh, as you can see, the red crosses are the expectation of the accuracy, which we, we could uh, uh, reconstruct the star formation rate evolution uh, thanks to gamma ray burst. Uh, the power of gamma ray burst is that their occurrence in a galaxy do not depend uh, on the mass or luminosity of the galaxy, which means that the gamma ray burst uh, can actually uh, unveil stars and galaxies, uh, or stars in galaxies that are uh, so weak that they, they are below the detection threshold or even powerful, uh, beautifully powerful machines like JWST. Uh, to give you even a, a more impressive impression of this, uh, uh, what you can see on the top left is the fading near infrared last levels, which fades away in a scale of a few days or a few weeks. And if you point, as you can see on the right, these six images are six images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in the direction of six very high ratio gamma ray bursts after this fading afterglow uh, disappeared. So as you can see, Actually, HST did not see anything, anything. So when pointed to the direction of the gamma ray burst after the afterglow, the, a, a sensitive facility like the Hubble Space Telescope does not see anything. This means that we know that in this direction, at this redshift, we have uh, six very high redshift galaxies, which, uh, uh, whose existence we know only thanks to gamma ray burst. So these are six galaxies below the detection threshold of HST. And this will be true also in the epoch of JWST, even though at uh, lower luminosity. This, in a few words, means that gamma ray burst can unveil the bulk of the population of primordial galaxies that are below the detection threshold 
of powerful facilities like HST or even JWST. Uh, but uh, not only thanks to gamma ray bursts, we know we can we can unveil the bulk of this population of the modern galaxies. But thanks to the absorption spectroscopy on the fading afterglow, that you can see on the left again, if we can uh, point uh, a sensitive uh, telescope before the afterglow fades away, thanks to absorption spectroscopy, as you can see here on the bottom, of these invisible galaxies, we can study the metallicity. You can see on the right part of the spectrum, these are the, the lines, absorption due to the metallicity. The neutral hydrogen fraction, you can see the broad uh, absorption feature, which is the hydrogen line and alpha feature. And on the left, you can see these are the features due to the intergalactic absorption in the intergalactic medium. So thanks to gamma ray burst, we, and this is the only method possible, we can unveil the bulk of the population of low mass luminosity galaxies in the primordial universe. And of these galaxies, we can study the metallicity, the neutral hydrogen fraction, and even the evolution of the properties of the intergalactic medium around them. So all of these information that are summarized here on the bottom, on the top right, are beyond reach of even the JWST telescope. Because uh, uh, again, the detection and spectroscopy of a galaxy with JWST depend on the luminosity of the galaxy. Of course, JWST is detecting the brightest part of the galaxies. Uh, and to do spectroscopy, to do some the redshift and the metallicity, it has a rely in is a very high luminosity. Instead, gamma ray burst uh, unveil and allow the study of galaxies independently on their mass and luminosity. Moreover, uh, most of the metals in these galaxies uh, lie in the uh, neutral interstellar medium, and you can detect them only through absorption spectroscopy. So you need a beacon. Uh, like gamma ray burst in these galaxies to do absorption spectroscopy, whereas JWST can do only, of course, emission spectroscopy, which is much more limited and provide only a very um, partial information on the properties of these galaxies. So all these capabilities of gamma ray burst for the early universe are uh, really impressive and are very well known by cosmologists. So the main issue here is that despite the many efforts uh, of facilities in space, so gamma ray burst detector in space, uh, um, optical infrared detectors on the ground, you are still stuck with only six, seven, uh, eight, or so less than 10 gamma ray bursts detected and identified at 3006. And this is because of, of the limitations of these facilities. And as I will uh, discuss later, uh, this can be overcome by next generation uh, gamma ray burst missions under study. So uh, the other uh, line of research in exploiting gamma ray bursts for cosmology, as I mentioned before, is what you see here on the second item, is actually to exploit them for uh, measuring cosmological parameters and hopefully shedding light to dark energy or testing alternative cosmological models. So first of all, uh, why we should look for more cosmological purposes? You can see in this uh, figure on the left, uh, now quite old, but just to give the idea, of course, we have a, a, a standard scenario, the so-called Lambda CDM cosmological model, uh, that comes from the combination of different very popular approaches for cosmology, especially the CMB, which is telling mostly that the universe is mostly flat, uh, as is predicted also by inflation. Uh, and type one supernovae. So um, then we have also galaxy clusters, uh, cosmic chronometers, and other methods, large scale structure. As you can see in this diagram, all these probes, uh, it is the combination of these probes which have different sensitivities with respect, for instance, to omega m, the density of matter, and omega lambda, the cosmological constant or density of dark energy. Uh, and it is thanks to the fact that these probes have different sensitivity combining them all together that we can get some tight constraints on the cosmological part. You can see very well here where these contours have different inclination. And this is due to the different distribution in redshift of each probe and also to the different methods uh, that are used to extract cosmological information from each uh, probe. So this is a first motivation. More probes we have, and more uh, we can combine them and get tightest and re more reliable clues on the cosmological parameters. 
Uh, and also, uh, this is also another uh, main issue, uh, each of these probes is affected by its own systematics. So let's take a popular case of type 1 supernovae based on which uh, combined with the CMB, it was uh, discovered that we live in an accelerating, uh, uh, expanding universe. Um, get, type 1 supernovae uh, are not standard candles by themselves, so they are standardized thanks to a relation between the peak magnitude and the decay time or stretch of the light curve. This is very well seen in the picture on the right, where on the top you see a sample of light curves of type 1 supernovae. As you can see, they have different peak magnitudes, but if you exploit this correlation, uh, you can uh, reconcile all of them and use them as standard can so use their peak magnitude standardized peak magnitude as a, a, lumin, a luminosity distance indicator uh, but of course uh, here there is a list of uh, the all the possible systematics affecting this kind of measurements um, so even this popular uh, very strong uh, cosmological distance indicator can be affected by civic uncertainties so if there is a, even a small uh, systematics in the laws that we use to calibrate a panel supernova of the order of point of magnitude, the contour in the omega m omega lambda plane uh, from type panel supernova would move in this way from the blue to the pink one. So, again, uh, putting together more uh, cosmological probes. Uh, help in getting rid of the relevant systematics that affect uh, each of the probes. So why uh, this is why we uh, it is important to add more and more cosmological probes, uh, and especially what is the strength of gamma ray burst? Of course, the strength of gamma ray burst is the ratio distribution, as you can see here as well. Let's have a look uh, at the bottom right. Uh, where the blue points here in this is Apple diagram, so which is distance moduli or luminosity distance as a function of redshift, which is a perfect plane to test different cosmological models because, of course, different cosmological models or different parameters in each cosmological model pro provide, um, predict a different uh, curve in this diagram. Uh, you can see the red points are gamma reversed, and you can see how they can extend the Hubble diagram up uh, sort of orders of magnitude uh, higher than type 1 supernovae or other probes. And of course, this is very important uh, to constrain the cosmological parameter and cosmological models. So uh, again, as for type 1 supernovae, also gamma ray bursts, we know very well, are not standard candles. They do not have a fixed peak luminosity or fixed isotropic radiated energy, as you can see here. Um, the isotropic equivalent radiated energy spans several orders of magnitude. And if we uh, use some in inference of the jet opening angle of the sources, still uh, this uh, radiated energy luminosity is not standard. So we need to find a way similar to what is done with type 1 supernovae to standardize uh, uh, gamma ray burst. And the most investiga investigated uh, tool or property of gamma ray burst for uh, standardizing them and exploiting them for this kind of cosmology is a correlation between the spectral peak energy and the total radiated energy or peak luminosity. So you, what you can see on the bottom left is a typical spectrum of a gamma ray burst, especially on the bottom part, if you uh, show the spectrum in terms of nu f nu, so this is the energy distribution as a function of photon energy, you see that there is a peak. So the typical spectral gamma ray burst, at least for most part of the gamma ray burst, and for most gamma ray burst, this is a typical spectral shape. You have a photon energy at which the, the new, new spectrum peaks. And this, this is called the peak energy. So it is a photon energy. It's a wavelength or a, a frequency. You know, it is a, uh, only the fact that uh, at this, uh, um, in X gamma rays, we characterize the wavelength or the frequency of a photon, of a radiation with photon energy. So this is, uh, if you wish, similar to the color of the gamma ray burst in the X gamma rays. It is uh, the photon energy or the wavelength at which you have the maximum of the emission. And uh, as you can see on the right, uh, it was found uh, by many studies, but discovered uh, 
by us based on Betposac's data first, uh, 20 years ago, that there is a strong correlation between the photon spectral peak energy and the total radiated energy. So uh, what we have is a correlation between an observable, so the spectral peak energy, so the photon energy at which the spectrum peaks, we measure the spectrum, we, uh, we find the photon energy E peak at which the spectrum peaks, we scale by one plus Z2, so plus the redshift to uh, the cosmological rest frame, and this is simply unmeasurable, unobservable. And this correlates with the quantity, which is uh, total radiated energy, which of course uh, depends on the measured fluence and uh, the cosmological models, of course, through the luminosity distance in this case. Uh, so in principle, we have a, a way, a tool to calibrate and to, to standardize gamma ray bars. We, know, we measure the photon peak energy, we can derive the radiated energy luminosity in a cosmologically independent way. But the, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a low redshift enough, low redshift gamma ray burst to uh, calibrate this correlation in a cosmologically independent way. So the method that is used to extract cosmological parameters from this correlation is to uh, fit all together um, the correlation and uh, the cosmological parameters. So the first step done in this direction was to assume a flat universe and ask ourselves what happened to the goodness of fit of the correlation if we change the value of omega m, so the matter density, from zero to one, uh, and each time we recompute the value of the ISO, the radiated energy of each gamma reverse, we fit the correlation and we measure a likelihood or a k square. And what we found is that the uh, goodness of fit, so the minus log likelihood, for instance, uh, has a nice parabolic shape as a function of omega m, the matter density, and uh, uh, minimizes at omega m around 0.3. So, which is uh, very well consistent what is found, what, with what is found with type a supernova and all the other probes, that if the universe is flat or mostly flat, omega m is significantly lower than one, which means that we live in an accelerating, expanding expansion universe, and it is around 0.3, which is exactly the same uh, value of omega m to which all the other probes, uh, type 1 supernovae, but then galaxy clusters and large baryonic acoustic oscillation, uh, point. So, uh, of course, we can also derive a quantitative estimate of uh, omega m, as you can see here, uh, as a function of also the number of gamma ray bursts in the sample. Uh, this exercise, let's say, uh, is a benchmark for this kind of study because it shows that through this correlation between the again the photon energy at which the spectrum peaks and the total radiated energy of the gamma ray burst uh, can produce can give us information on cosmological parameters in a way completely independent on any other cosmological probes and uh, provides the same goes in the same direction as all the other probes uh, just to remark if we could do this exercise 25 years ago, for instance, we would have provided evidence that omega is significantly lower than one uh, and that the universe is accelerating independently or even before type 1 supernovae or the other probes. Uh, we can go further, we can release the flat universe assumption and uh, so uh, leave free to vary also omega lambda and we will obtain a contour that is what is shown here in pink. Uh, in, in this diagram, which is already comparable with what you can obtain with type 1 supernovae, for instance. But of course, uh, after this first basic step, uh, our final aim uh, in investigating gamma ray bursts for this cosmology is not simply to have a further confirmation that omega m is low, significantly lower than 1 and that it is around 0.3. Uh, of course, uh, we aim at, uh, uh, in perspective, providing a substantial contribution, for instance, to us investigating the properties of dark energy or the cosmological constant or whatever um, it is, this component which is dominating the universe, uh, and or test deviation uh, or cosmological models which predict deviation or expansions of the Einstein field equation or alternative uh, cosmological models. So this is because, uh, uh, again, as I remarked before, 
the strength, the uniqueness of gamma ray bursts with respect to type 1 supernovae, baryonic acoustic oscillations, and other probes is that its extension uh, to very high ratio, to ratio more than nine. And which is particularly uh, suited for doing this kind of test on dark energy models, on alternative cosmological scenarios. Uh, or, or already we can obtain uh, more stringent uh, um, estimates of cosmological paradigm and bust if we calibrate them with other cosmological probes. So as much as type 1 supernovae are calibrated against CFATs, we can calibrate gamma ray bursts against type 1 supernovae. Uh, so we can take those gamma ray bursts that have a redshift lower than 1.7, which is more or less the limit, the upper limit to the redshift of type 1 supernovae, and use the luminosity distance derived from type 1 supernovae to, uh, to reconstruct the peak isocorrelation and calibrate it, and then apply it to higher ratio gamma ray bursts, and we can obtain this kind of uh, Hubble diagram, especially on the on the bottom right, you see in blue type 1 supernovae, in red baryonic acoustic oscillation, and in dark, in black, uh, gamma ray burst. So you see how the Hubble diagram obtained by calibrating the peak iso correlation on type 1 supernovae beautifully expands uh, what can be done with other probes. Uh, and this first order uh, consistent with this extrapolation. Of course, in this way, gamma ray bursts are no more independent but uh, are, in this case, and allowed to extend what can be done with only type 1 supernovae. Lorenzo, you have uh, five minutes left. Okay, five minutes. How many, sorry? Five minutes. Okay, so, okay I'm going to conclusion. So this is uh, putting together gamma ray bars with AGNs or other probes, but let me so go quickly forward. So I discovered to now the high power of gamma ray burst, long gamma ray burst for exploring the early universe, as I mentioned in the first part of my talk, for galaxies, for star force galaxies, um, a science that cannot be done even with the JWST, but will be very much complementary and measuring cosmological parameter and ultimately uh, investigating dark energy properties or the cosmological constant or alternative cosmological scenario. And this is part of uh, this science of the main science case for next generation gamma ray burst uh, concepts that are being developed by in the international community in Europe, in USA, in Japan, in, hopefully in China, and uh, uh, for the next decade. And um, here I mentioned some of them. TGUS is the European uh, project already selected and studied by the European Space Agency, ESA, that we have IZ Gundam in Japan and Gamma Explorer. The most advanced is Tisius, which is uh, uh, led by Italy and uh, UK, France, uh, Germany and Switzerland on behalf of a large European consortium. Uh, Tisius, uh, which stands from Transient High Energy Scandal Universe Survey, is a mission concept already uh, selected by ESA in 2018 for a three-year phase A study. Uh, for a possible launch in 2032, but uh, and now has been selected again for a study for a possible launch in 2037. You can find a lot of literature in the uh, on the internet. You are in the bottom. I mentioned some of uh, of it, uh, and also on the TCUs website. But in a few words, uh, the concept of TCUs, which is similar to all these other mission uh, that are being sold. So this is the, for the next decade. So this is like the, the dream of the gamma ray burst community is to expand the current limitation, uh, so the current capabilities of current gamma ray burst monitor, which prevent the detection of the bulk of the population of very high ratio gamma ray bursts that we need for cosmology, uh, by using a set of monitors that extend the monitoring of the sky from uh, above 10 kV down to 0.3 uh, kV. So in the, in the soft X-ray regime, because it is there that we expect that uh, we have the bulk, uh, of course, of a very high redshift gamma ray burst, whose emission is, of course, high redshift. So just to give you an idea, the Swift satellite or the Fermi GBM and so on are limited to above 10 kV. They operate above 10 kV for monitoring the gamma ray burst here we want to go down to 0.3 kV. So we will improve by two orders of magnitude and with a very deep uh, sensitivity. The other uh, asset of this mission is to carry direct on board a near infrared telescope 
that can be pointed thanks to the space casualty capability, to the direction of the gamma ray burst that have been localized by the monitors, and to catch the fading in afterglow that, as I showed at the beginning, is the key feature of gamma ray burst, is the beacon that uh, illuminates, that unveil these primordial galaxies, otherwise most of them completely invisible, and then and provide us through absorption spectroscopy, the metallicity, neutralization and fraction, and the study also the intergalactic medium. So this is uh, the asset, and just to give you a flavor, this is the progress that we expect. So this, uh, this is the current situation. Uh, you can see at the cosmic cone on the right, the grad, the, these gray points are the gamma ray burst with measured redshift distribution, distributing this cosmological cone. The dotted line corresponds to redshift of six. So above this line, we are in the first billion years of the universe. As I discussed before, we have only a few gamma ray bars, despite 30, 25, 30 years of efforts by space and ground facilities. Instead, with this use in only 3.5 years of operation, you would uh, get a sample which is represented by these red dots. So you would put many tens or even uh, in a few more years, because this is a mission that could operate also 10 or 20 years. So 3.5 years is just a nominal duration of reference. You could get 50, 100 gamma ray bursts at HL6. So that's allow you the full exploitation uh, of gamma ray bursts for, uh, for cosmology. So I conclude mentioning that, of course, this kind of mission will also provide detection and characterization of all kinds of gamma ray bursts to investigate deeply the physics, the extreme physics and fundamental physics uh, that can be unveiled through gamma ray burst, and also of many other classes of transients, and will be very much synergic with all the other big facilities that are uh, built, uh, currently being built uh, in the electromagnetic domain, like ELT in the optical, uh, or TMT, SKA in the radio, CTA at very high energy, but new Athena in the X-ray, and especially, you know, and of course, also gravitational wave detectors of the future. So I leave you with this, my conclusions, uh, and thank you very much for, for the attention. Okay, thank you, thank you. And we have two very short questions. Uh, uh, well, uh, the images uh, that you showed uh, of uh, the sample of very tiny redshift gamma papers without. Uh, any view uh, of gas pose. Uh, is these are these images of, from the James Webb or are going to be taken by the James Webb observation to be heard in both uh, institutions of the environment? And the second question is can you refer to the interaction that the Mamma has? Are advocated to the economic and most models of the end of the massive star between 25 and 40 solar masses with the primordial composition, chemical composition, predict almost uh, entire collapse for this. Uh, of this uh, phase you are living, knowing and we do not have luminous supernova. And I will not have the moral that I have heard, but I want to have the same supernova itself. What is the status of this comparison of observation with the theory of the uh, yes, yeah, so uh, concerning the first question, uh, so these are the six images. These are pointings by the Hubble Space Telescope. So these were uh, deep pointings by the Hubble, so which, as you know, is, was the most sensitive facility before JWST for catching these very Russian galaxies. Uh, so this shows that this uh, that at least most of the host galaxies of gamma ray burst at this very redshift are invisible to HST. Uh, we don't have uh, up to now pointing of JWST uh, to these uh, directions. Uh, but of course, 
uh, the expectation, but by simply extrapolating with the sensitivity, is that uh, uh, this will be true also for a significant fraction of primordial galaxy. Of course, JWST pushes uh, towards a much deeper uh, uh, so sensitivity, of course, but as you can see from the published data up to now, uh, at least most, if not all, the primordial galaxies that are being detected by JWST at this very redshift or even higher are bright and unexpectedly bright galaxies. Uh, there are um, instead any reasonable extrapolation uh, provides uh, support to the idea that the bulk of the or a substantial fraction of primordial galaxy have a luminosity as low as to be below the detection threshold of the JWST. But moreover, this is not only uh, the, the other part of the story, is that we can provide also target for JWST. So where JWST, JWST can, of course, de, make uh, uh, deep fields, ultra deep fields, uh, it will be, this will be done in the next uh, months or years, but here we can provide him where to point. So we provide also target. Yes. So a fraction of these galaxies may be visible to JWST, but only because uh, you have the gamma ray burst telling you yes. where to point. So and then I missed the second part of the of the question. Uh, it was about uh, the origin of long gamma ray burst and core collapse supernovae. Yes, uh, the second uh, question is uh, uh, what model of uh, mass star evolution. Oh, so, yes, so, sorry. Unfortunately, I, I cannot hear very well. I just uh, so maybe you you can you can write me yes. in the chat. But just to 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 uh, oh, sorry, just to to conclude. I mean, I don't want to take too too much time. Uh, there are there is a sample of uh, of, of type one BC supernovae which are associated to to gamma ray burst. Uh, there, are quite, there are a few tens of, of them. Um, so for the cosmological purposes, um, the evidence is that from lower redshift gamma ray burst is that gamma ray burst follow or trace quite well the star formation rate evolution. There is some possibly some bias which can be assessed uh, uh, thanks to the lower redshift um, measurements. So for the Cosmological purposes, what we can say, uh, we know now, uh, I mean, how, how long gamma ray bursts are good tracers uh, or of star formation rate evolution and uh, what kind of galaxies they unveil. Yes. So, especially. Lorenzo, Lorenzo, yes? uh, very nice talk. And uh, uh, at the same time, believe me, we have been discussing very much about the role of your uh, Theseus mission here with Nanzang, and uh, I invite you uh, strongly to look uh, our recent uh, um, uh, paper, we just appear in Astropiage on uh, GRB 090643, and um, the role of uh, uh, Theseus for that source. But there are many new results coming out, believe me. And uh, the fact that you will be in Pescara next week will give us ample time to review the novelties. And of course, we all agree that the data of uh, GRD are very important and Theseus or something similar uh, created by Nanzang 
in the in the Einstein mission right away without waiting too long, but yeah. motivating eventually for Theseus earlier is very, very important for the detection of gravitational wave in very early GRB sources. On the other side, I think there is something enormous coming out from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, data of James Webb. The presence, even at Z larger than nine, of very large black hole of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 solar masses. And there are many. And this means a change of paradigm. And it will be very important that we discuss this thing next week in Pescara. Be there. Yes. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. And, and cheers also to Lan Zang. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Professor, our next speaker will be Professor Postanov from Moscow State University. Thank you very much <coughs> for inviting me to this conference, and I am uh, happy to share you some uh, recent results, some observations about the possible appearance, astrophysical appearance of primordial black holes. And um, mm, the outline of my talk is as follows: I briefly, I briefly described the formation of primordial black holes and. Uh, in different mechanism, and uh, we will concentrate on um, some recent findings from from gravitational wave observations, where we really observe uh, black holes of very high masses, which is not very easy to 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 understand using uh, from our astrophys purely astrophysical point of view. And um, um, of course, uh, the last but not least, uh, uh, very important point is the. Um, primordial black holes that seek for early uh, uh, growth of um, uh, galaxy formation, which have been discussed already in this conference many times. And um, uh, there, it is several principal reasons for popularity of the hypothesis of primordial black holes stems from the fact that um, uh, they can naturally form in the early universe and uh, they simultaneously can substantially contribute to dark matter. And I'll show you that in some models, it can even comprise the, uh, the all of dark matter can, can reside in, 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 in such kind of uh, objects. And of course, uh, as I mentioned already, they can be the seed for early galaxy formation. Okay, the formation of black hole, primordial black hole was first uh, <coughs> mentioned by uh, proposed by Jakob Vildovich in 1967. And then there have been um, a lot of papers, and uh, famous papers by Stephen Hawking, Brandon Carrot, and many others. But the idea is very simple. If you have a pertur uh, some perturbation, density perturbation in the early universe, when it re-enters the horizon and uh, its size is higher than the Schwarzschild radius, it, must, it, sh it should collapse into a black hole. And uh, it is, uh, and the mass of the of this collapsing object it should be of order of, of the mass of the cosmological horizon at that time. That is the um, if you put the figures, um, and you find that um, how to how to pointer use the pointer uh, ah sorry, and uh, it is of order of several solar masses. And at time of uh, QCD phase transitions, which I'll describe a little bit in more detail later, and it's very suggestive that this uh, this figure is a photo of solar masses, which is very important for from astrophysical point of view. Point of view. So, um, uh, but when <coughs> when the <coughs> perturbation re-enters the the, <coughs> the um, cosmological horizon. It stops expanding and uh, recollapses, but it should struggle against pressure, the surrounding pressure. And if the equation of state is uh, in radiative radiation 
dominated epoch, then uh, W is of order of one, one third, and um, then the, um, its size should exist the genes length, and it's very easy. It was realized in, in, the, in, in the 70s that uh, the amplitude of perturbation should be much higher than some critical value, which is of order of this parameter one third. But, uh, but this is a matter of very, very large <laughs> discussion in the literature and kinds of simulations, and that it, uh, it could be something small or something great, but anyway, <coughs> of order of this value. And uh, there's been <coughs> a, a, a lot of various constraints for the, uh, in terms of the, uh, of, the, of the fraction of primordial back hole in, uh, relative to the total uh, cold dark matter density in the universe. And uh, these constraints had been several times summarized in many reviews, and this very popular review of Carr and colleagues. There have been, uh, you see that <coughs> there are some open, open areas, but this actually, uh, all, all these constraints uh, from different uh, sorts of, uh, of, of observations are um, very, uh, have been derived uh, uh, assuming that there is a um, monochromatic uh, primordial black hole mass function, so all black holes have a more or less the same mass. But in fact, it's natural uh, to, uh, and I will show you that uh, the extended mass, uh, mass functions of black hole um, yes, become, you know, when, when you take it into account, these constraints are not very robust. But uh, anyway, uh, you see that uh, there are, in, 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 at, uh, if you have a of order of one solar mass, you have some uh, area for, uh, so, uh, for black holes in the regions of solar and 10 and 30, maybe 100 solar masses, something like that. It, it was very exciting. And uh, but and now and the reason uh, in the few unit years this uh, uh, these constraints then turned into into uh, in, into a positive evidence in some sense, and uh, uh, if you took them, uh, so the area of um, of this not area but the boundary of these constraints as a pos if you take it as a positive evidence that the some fraction of uh, of uh, dark matter is inside, uh, contained inside these black holes, then you produce this uh, figure. You see uh, uh, in, in the mass range of 10 to minus 12 to 10 to 8 solar masses, um, uh, it, of course, there are no unity everywhere, uh, but if you, um, if you use the extended mass function for the primordial black holes, you may easily <coughs> fit uh, this distribution to this constraint, it was done uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was a big uh, review by Brennan Carr, and it relates for a specific model of uh, um, black hole formation, uh, which relates to the equation, change of equational state during uh, PCD phase transition in the early universe. This is a famous uh, uh, phase diagram where there is a barium chemical potential and the temperature and MeV, and uh, you usually assume that uh, uh, the, uh, in the standard model that the, at zero, the uh, phase transition occurs almost at zero um, uh, baryon chemical potential of, of quarks. Um, and um, uh, then its temperature is of order of 150 or something like that. Uh, 150 MeV, <clears throat> and um, but if uh, you consider more closely to this uh, to, to this phase transition, then recent studies suggest that in fact uh, the number of uh, number of uh, degrees of freedom during uh, during uh, evolution of the universe from high temp from very heating to uh, and to high temperature and radiation dominated epoch. It, it changes uh, uh, rather, rather strongly, and this means that the uh, effective equation of state, uh, W, parameter W, also uh, changes uh, as, as, as a function of temperature with some pronounced uh, features, and these features uh, immediately translated to the, if you assume that there are some 
Gaussian fields of fluctuations which were produced by inflation, then uh, this, uh, this deviation in uh, parameter W uh, will, would, would translate it to the uh, formation of uh, fraction of black holes which has been formed during this phase transition. And most of them should be concentrated at, uh, at, at the temperature where the most strongly peak occurs and the mass characteristic mass of the primordial black hole should be of order of Chandrasekhar limit. It's like nature and to understand order one solar mass. So, and this picture immediately translates into the, uh, uh, if you believe into this picture and uh, take into, and assumes the, um, the, um, the Gaussian perturbations, initial Gaussian perturbation, uh, perturbations after inflation, you would produce, uh, depending on the, on the tilt, uh, you, would assume, you would find this, uh, some interesting function which was proposed in 2021 by Garcia Belida and colleagues. And, uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, the, if this is the spectrum, mass spectrum of the primordial black holes, then uh, you, you may just uh, compare this uh, curve with uh, observations, and you find that there are some interesting, not one by one correspondence, but something which could, could, could point you that maybe there are some uh, indications that uh, indeed uh, this upper limits taken as uh, considered as positive evidence um, confirm this, or not confirm, but is consistent with this, uh, this idea. But there is another scenario, and a lot of another scenarios. I even cannot enumerate them there, uh, for, for, for formation of primordial black holes. But one of the interesting uh, scenarios uh, based on modified Affleck dime biogenesis is proposed by Sasha Dolgov and Joe Silk in 1993, that uh, it, 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 it is more complicated because it, it, is, it, it requires additional scalar, <coughs> additional complex color field uh, during the inflation, but this color field can be uh, charged, uh, have, can carry baryon charge and ends up and uh, ends up rotating in this space toward different direction during the evolution after the end of, toward the end of inflation to produce uh, different <coughs> uh, domains uh, either uh, in, in space with different baryon charge. Uh, they call this uh, high baryon uh, HBB regions. Uh, and uh, they become isocurve fluctuations. There are no density fluctuations, but there are uh, just baryon charge uh, fluctuations in the region. And at QCD phase transition, you immediately have uh, the regions with, uh, high um, with high density. It turns into very high density fluctuations from uh, during this phase transition, and it uh, will produce uh, a, a just very funda fundamental log normal mass spectrum for in, the, in, the, in this kind of model. It has two parameters which cannot be taken from, from the initial theory, but should be taken from some observations. The consequences of this model is uh, it, 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 it will lead to a non-standard uh, 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 primordial nuclear synthesis with high baryon to photon ratio, not 10 to, six times 10 to minus 10, but it could be of order of 0 0.1, and it, it can convert different size, uh, different sorry sign, and, uh, and this model also predicts the formation of large antimatter domain in the universe. They can be possible, it is possible in this model, and there are several investigations of and clues how to find these anti stars and probably using AMS results, AMS two results about uh, finding of uh, um, anti helium nuclei also supports this idea. And the uh, important thing that this uh, model also, uh, also have an extended tail which it ends to the, to the required region for the cosmological seeds for uh, super, uh, um, supermassive black holes growth in the early universe. So let me, uh, let me concentrate on gravitational wave observations. Uh, this is a famous picture. You see this, uh, the siren during uh, inspiring of two black holes. 
which <coughs> enables you to read off the most important property and the most important property from this kind of inspiral science is the, the so-called chirp mass, which is the combination of a specific combination of masses of, of, the, of the collision uh, bodies. And uh, it, it reads off immediately from observations, and it has a most accurate measurement in gravitational wave science. And the parameter from these observations, not only chirp mass, but also the effective spins of the collision body, as you know, may be found, but with much less uh, certainty. And of course, uh, it's possible to estimate the luminosity distance and the redshift of these events, but again, with much higher, by much uh, higher uncertainties. So let's concentrate on the chirp mass uh, in the first place because it's most precisely determined. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the catalog of events which have been published. You know now, starting on last month, the 04, uh, measurement uh, is going on, and every day, almost every day, we have uh, we have new measurements, but they haven't been analyzed uh, ultimately, and uh, first results to, to appear in a few months. And uh, um, among these sources, 90 sources, uh, there are, of course, several interesting, uh, <coughs> for instance, uh, Newton star neutron star collisions, which I will not discuss a bit, uh, at all, but uh, and uh, and uh, some suspicious uh, events, which has a high mass ratio, or and or, or mass or masses of the secondary component in the mass gap, or even in the range of uh, neutron star masses. It, it probably we have we deal with neutron star plus black hole collisions, but we have no any other indications uh, but the only the masses to prove that the second, the second component is indeed the neutron star. So the statistical property uh, <coughs> of, this, of this catalog is uh, discussed many times, but the most important is that um, uh, when I, 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 I again um, uh, uh, stress that there are some uh, uh, specific events, uh, specific events um, uh, which has, especially those which has the highest masses, the highest masses in, in order of 100 solar masses before the collisions, not after the collisions, but before the collisions. And these exceptional uh, black holes, and for example, 90521, <coughs> which has been discussed many, many times, and even if you look today's archive, you will find one paper about this source, whether people, the people dispute about these masses, uh, are they so high, maybe even high, uh, people claim that it could be 170 solar mass of, of the black hole. And, and so and, uh, the problem is that uh, it is, it's not easy because if you have a high, high mass of collision by this, uh, your, your range of, in, of, on the sensitivity detector before the collisions is so small, that it's very difficult to distinguish between the signal, this kind of signals for different assumptions about the sources, about their masses and spins. And it was a paper by Gamba in Nature Astronomy last year, which showed you that this particular signal can be uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven or eight uh, equally well fits will produce this kind of signal. But with totally different parameters. For example, in this, in this paper, they, the authors insist that the, the, uh, the effective spins of the, this uh, sources must be zero. And, uh, uh, and, and the original paper by uh, LIGO community, uh, it uh, instead have a very high spin uh, for this black hole. So it is not, uh, especially for high mass uh, range, it is very difficult to uh, uh, exactly pre uh, determine the parameters. So, um, let me say a few words about astrophysics and that the standard model for binary new, uh, compact object formation uh, elaborated <laughs> already f almost 50, ti 50 years ago and it's confirmed by many, many uh, different uh, kind of observations uh, then the, then the, and even used to predict the collision rate and explain in many, in many aspects of the binary black hole and binary neutron star formations. And, uh, but it has still, for, for binary black hole formation, it has 
kills several important crucial issues. For, uh, first of all, this is a mass loss from very massive start, which is very model dependent, and it plays a crucial role because uh, even uh, in the main sequence, you can decrease the mass of the optical, of the optical star so uh, such that it, it cannot produce very massive stars. The second important point, the, uh, point is the, the appearance of so-called black hole mass gaps, and especially this one, between 60 and 130 solar masses, which is not easy to accommodate <coughs> uh, black hole in this massive. It's not easy to accommodate with the standard stellar evolution because of formation electron-positron pairs in, in, in the core of, uh, of the massive star prevents it already at the stage of oxygen burning. It can explode altogether without, <laughs> without leaving any remnant. Uh, so it so-called um, pulsation stability supernova. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, but uh, for only for very, very high mass cores of stars, you can, helium cores, uh, the collapse is allowed. And this is possible uh, if you assume, uh, if, you, if you consider, not assume, but uh, consider and calculate the evolution of stars with uh, chemical composition free from metals, and with low Z, uh, not some much, much subsolar, which can exist at, at high redshifts, of course, and for example, population three stars, which mentioned many times, and uh, can produce this kind of, of, of animals. And, uh, and probably we even have first evidence of uh, this explosion of without, uh, uh, in this archive, a paper uh, last month, uh, the people claim that probably this event is associated with parent stability supernova, which doesn't produce any remnant, not black hole, not looking star, nothing, it just explodes. And uh, <coughs> um, uh, there are uh, many, many explanations of how to, uh, I mean, astrophysical, how to produce such a massive black hole without involving, without, uh, involving hypothesis of primordial black hole. And, uh, but still, uh, it is possible to, uh, to, and there are uh, a lot of literature in this, uh, in the sense, it is possible also to consider that another hypothesis. Suppose we have a, a realm of uh, binary black holes, the, uh, the formation of black hole, binary black holes in the universe, early universe, uh, then discussed. Time. Uh, and, and it is um, not very difficult to, to, uh, to, to, to calculate what should be the merging rate of these binary black holes as a function of their mass distribution uh, <coughs> and as a function of time or redshift, which is the same. Uh, and, um, but people usually use this formula in their calculations, assuming that uh, the black primordial black holes are distributed homogeneously on by Poisson, Poissonian distribution of such events. But in fact, they, uh, there are some strong uh, how say, theoretical arguments that primordial black holes could be form some um, clusters. And then uh, this, uh, this uh, um, estimates of the collision rate should be, uh, should be, uh, should be um, uh, corrected. And, uh, uh, the, mm, the point is that uh, taken that, uh, take, uh, taken that as, as it is, this uh, uh, calculation suggests that you need just tiny amount, 10 to the minus, uh, say, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, of uh, fraction of black holes uh, with uh, 10 or 100 solar masses to explain the emergent rate observed by uh, uh, gravitational wave observatory. And, uh, but at, at, um, in 1919, we considered, the mo uh, is it possible to, to describe the distribution of chirp mass of uh, these uh, collision black holes, just, just purely uh, this uh, log normal mass distribution. Uh, so we assume that, uh, for instance, that there is log normal mass distribution and uh, for emission black holes, and you evolve it and uh, taking into account the sensitivity of your detector as a function of redshift, you calculate what should be the mass distribution of this, uh, chip mass distribution of this uh, collision uh, binary black holes. And you find uh, on general good agreement with 
observations, but take, you look at these middle uh, ranges of whether it was wet and solar masses, there is some deficit of sources here, and uh, it was a little bit worrying. And uh, in, indeed, after the, this catalog appeared, mm -hmm. uh, you see that there are some uh, hints of bumps in the distribution of chirp masses. Of course, there are some errors, and the statistics, I, I repeat again, it increases every day. And it would be interesting to see what kind, which kind of these bumps survive or not uh, in a year of, uh, in, during all four observations uh, by, by the next Zildoich meeting, for example. And um, uh, uh, the, the first peak, and even this part of uh, uh, black hole masses, is very easily dis uh, understandable. It can be described by the simplest <coughs> model of binary black hole formation. Uh, assuming that the blind binary black hole mass is <coughs> just uh, of almost all CO core uh, uh, in the end uh, collapses into the black hole and, and uh, without any additional kicks, any complications, but take into, uh, we can take, take into account uh, black hole rotation uh, and angular uh, uh, and tidal orbital synchronization of binaries, all these standard astrophysical assumptions which people usually do um, and uh, you consider standard massive binary evolution without invoking additional parameters and taking into account chemical composition as a function of redshift. So all these be huge astrophysical uncertainties are in, in, included here in the uh, standard parameter and also taking into account star formation rate in galaxies as a function of redshift. So you put everything and you make this uh, calculation and you find interesting result in green shown is the distribution of expected ma chirp mass distribution of these astrophysical black holes with which, which very good uh, uh, describe the initial part of this, um, of this distribution until uh, chirp mass is something in 20. So uh, uh, chirp mass is not the, actually the mass of the massive, it, it depends on the mass ratio. So masses here are 30 or 40 solar masses uh, for black holes. Uh, for components, <coughs> and uh, uh, the remaining part, the remaining part of this distribution, uh, is perfectly fixed with uh, log normal binary primordial black hole formation, and the uh, fraction of them should be just 10 to the minus four. It doesn't violate any existing constraints on this on this on this fraction. And you see uh, what is here, what's shown here in this just uh, interesting. Picture, but I repeat again that uncertainty in high mass uh, definition, the uh, determination of high mass black hole in, in these coalition binaries, and this uh, deficit of the sources here should be confirmed by further observations. And moreover, we can play this game even further. For instance, we can look at what kind of uh, this, this uh, binary black hole, astrophysical black holes, what kind of spins they would have, effect, effective spins during the coalitions. And this is the result uh, uh, in, 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 in black dots without errors, show run, show run, uh, 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 effective spins and, uh, and mass ratios of merging black holes found from, uh, from uh, El 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 virgo collaboration. And, uh, and this is this uh, color diagram shows you the probability distribution of for astrophysical black holes, which more or less consistent with what we observe. Uh, moreover, if we, uh, if we ask ourselves what about the primordial black holes, binary black holes, we also have some calculations how to have to have effective spins, large effective spins during uh, the evolution of uh, uh, eccentric binary black holes, and you find that they can explain also the, uh, uh, this, this time we show this, this, these errors, which are huge, of course. <laughs> but anyway, you can uh, find uh, uh, in this model uh, uh, black, black effective spins quite large. So, um, and the major question is, if, for instance, uh, uh, we believe that there must be a peak of bi primordial black, binary black holes at wild solar masses, do we see them? In, in LIGO Virgo data, for example, and the people, of course, ask themselves what <coughs> if this is the case, and, and there are some candidates of uh, 
of uh, uh, events which has a secondary mass uh, very small. And, but this is binary black holes. It could not be, uh, it's highly unlikely that these are neutron stars. Probably they are black holes with very small masses. And they, from astrophysics, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to obtain them, if any. And, uh, uh, but this is a tentative. This paper never published. It, it's just an archive. And, uh, you know, and we have to, I think that the LIGO people are very cautious about this, this kind of statements because uh, the signal to noise ratio of these events and formal arm rates are, are consistently are not that, that, that big, so they need much higher sensitivity to improve the statistics of scale. So, and uh, probably my first, almost last slide, and the, uh, uh, if the, the primordial black holes exist and they binary, which, which have uh, at, which coalesce at redshift Z large than 20, could not be produced by stars because uh, nobody believes that at very high redshift stars must exist, right? So, but the prospects for detection was <coughs> of such kind of events were, were considered in, in, uh, by, by Kaiser and McWilliams. And uh, if you cut this Z20, you see that, of course, there are some possibility, but with not very, <coughs> with significant mass, mass uh, significant signal to noise ratio, but only with huge detections, uh, current detections, of course, it's impossible to check this. Um, I, I skip the SMBH astronomy, which is discussed many times, and my conclusion is that, uh, conclusion said that, uh, I, that, that the statement uh, that primordial black holes can naturally form in the universe, in the universe and uh, probably uh, we have a positive evidence of broad, broad mass uh, spectrum black holes, uh, which, are produced, which have been produced during QCD phase transition, and uh, uh, but uh, the uh, gravitation wave detectors of binary black holes doesn't exclude uh, the, the presence of the populations of, uh, uh, of high mass black holes with initially primordial high mass black holes with initially log normal spectrum dif different from, 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 from this um, model. But, uh, and uh, that's what actually I would like to say. Thank you very much, but my last slide would be this one, okay, thank you very much. This is a galactic black hole. This is a galactic black hole. Yeah. It's a black hole with a, with a star. Yes, like with solar. Uh, high metallicity. Yes, solar metallicity. No problem to form a black hole with solar metallicity up to 60 solar masses. That was my point to the yes. previous uh, speaker. Ah. Again, there might be uh, uh, gamma reserves with a Super luminous supernova. This yes. is my, my first point. Yes. The second point that intrigues me, if you go to your, your slide where you show the results of work by Lee Cole, the study. Which one? Uh, this Lee one. Cole, sorry. Yes. Where you put. Uh, This one. This one. The 
Ten to the four. This is my paper. Yes, sorry, I, I cannot do it so, so fast. Probably this one. Yes. Yes. But on what was the assumption? Of the I, on the previous slide, this is this model which produces this kind of spectrum for primordial black holes. And, the, and it extends, this is log normal distribution, which extends up to very high masses. And the, in this particular model, the upper, upper mass of this uh, distribution is determined by, it's not infinity, is determined by the uh, temperature of reheating in the early universe. And so this is a model dependent result, but it, 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 it agrees with, um, with uh, uh, we considered in this paper the uh, first uh, uh, LIGO merging in this particular case. And um, so if you take uh, a parameter gamma of order of one and m of order of 10 or 20, you will receive this kind of uh, consistency. You would receive the required rate of binary mergings detected by LIGO, and you would have some fraction of this uh, uh, high, mass, high massive stars, which is consistent also with the space density of uh, this SMBH, early SMBH at that time. This is why. Yes, it's in G it was published in GCAP. Maybe. Thank you. We will see you <laughs> sometime. This is correct. Hello. Uh, thank you for the next talk. Uh, I know there are some predictions of signatures from the evaporation of the model that we in gamma oh. rays. So I wonder if these are interesting to you or not. And no, it is quite different part of, of the masses. It's over here. And we discussed the solar mass most of, mostly. So these constraints I didn't discuss them at all. Very last or conclusion? <laughs> this one. Ah. <laughs> it's classical statement by Wittgenstein.
About 700,000. Well, 700,000. I cannot lose 700,000. Cannot. Mm -hmm. But we are looking at one. Yes, but they, they, they try to adjust them. This one, this is the first. Astronomy report? Astronomy report, probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. This one. Thank you very much.
have to go to see all of them like this because it's not the same feeling. Yeah, I see. But you pick up the same as people do it. Thank you very much for your note. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. Can you gently take a reference on the reference I hope you understood what they meant. Yes, I understood what you meant. I know what you said. Yes. Uh, I can write it for you. Yes, you can. Новый файл, да. 
آقای لیکن هر تگوراته این چه رفته؟ چه 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 مورنی کو برای؟ فقط
we'll see. Otherwise, I'll find out from my laptop. Cannot play major. No, I'll find out. Oh, yeah. 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 I'll find out from my laptop. Okay. I'll give you. Uh, I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Want to check? I have to. Actually, the line has a bit. Just move it. of presentation, uh, yeah. PowerPoint version. Could be actually. Mm. You can convert it to PDF if you want. Ah, then the movies are not working as well. Or, or use your own computer. Or yeah, use yeah, your, own computer. your own computer. Okay, that is the best. Have you an HDMI port? I will tap it. Mm. Yeah, great. Okay, you have good in the HDMI or something? Try one. Go no problem. Back. Uh, it's, it's most likely due to PowerPoint version. Yeah. Okay. So we, which this HDMI one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, uh, did you copy 
computing. I, I can just yeah, it's cockpit already. It's in cockpit. Yeah, it looks good. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Well, thank, thanks. Okay. I will give you. A when I come here, where can I find it on the desktop? Uh, or who is chair? Uh, I am the chair. Here. You are a chair? Yeah, I'm in a chair. Yeah, please, right, please. Okay. It's morning session. Okay. This, this folder is open? Just in the morning? Yes. Okay. It's Friday morning, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's right. Oh, let me provide our... Oh, email, email, email. I forgot about that one. Uh, Okay, now let's start the photo of that. Uh, Gregory sent me a proper one. Let's actually use my... Use another account. Which one yeah, is This Gmail account. Sorry, I don't see this one. I don't know if you sent it. Which one is a proper one? Sorry. Okay, then, Olaf, so you see your email? It's okay, just I don't know which account they sent to. Do I will find it? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have posted my presentation on the official website. Uh, on which one? Yeah, the public one. So if, if it is not hard, can you send that out with this email? No, no, it is opening this email. Just send yeah, I'm opening my email. I think it's sent. The sent it to a Dovich meeting, yeah. I, it's, if you go to the website of the Dovich meeting uh, under my name, Daniel Gregoris, uh, you'll find uh, my presentation video. Problem mm -hmm. that I have no access and wrong, I thought so. I thought so. Yeah, but I do have access to the email. Maybe just see. Just previous Gregory does all that thing. <laughs> That's why <laughs> I have no idea. You see, I have a lot of different emails. Oh, wait. I have access to this. How much this is the group mail? Yes. Is it done? And the log, uh, local organization committee. Yeah, yeah. Local Let's go to it. Uh, yeah, let me see the. Oh, uh, I didn't know sorry, that you your email or something? It's my mail. No, but I didn't send it to you by email. I have no, I just organized something member, so maybe yeah. I can see it. Just fine, just yes, see everything there. So not in this email. I don't know which email my they put in the committee. Maybe I should ask in our ex one. This account. So I can remove Greg or the account. No, there is nothing? No, but what I'm saying is that it's uh, nothing but a public website. Uh, so. Flash? Better solution. See, when I am running in pendrive itself, but in my laptop. Okay, you can, uh, can you can use your laptop. You have this, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then I don't need to. Just come with your laptop. Just tie one. Like in case it was, maybe that time, this is the file actually. Presentation under the type. This is the one you copied that time? Yeah. Are you in this committee? Are you in this email? Well, I have no idea. Can you see? Do I don't remember my another email address or password. But I wanted to show that it's copied by Oh, I sent you. I don't remember the password of my this email. Maybe they forward put my this email address. The first one. The first one. Any other paragraph? I have no idea. Yeah. I will put it in the... Morning, afternoon, yeah. Okay, morning, afternoon. This morning, you can meet afternoon. You are in the morning, yes. Morning, yes. Morning, you will speak yes. in the morning. Right, yeah. sir. Okay. This morning, this morning. This you want, you want ah, to. So, so we have, we have. This is a conferred, okay? So uh, uh, then we, we should find it. 
Oh, this is Indigo. Indigo. Oh, Indigo. I see. Yeah, yeah. You, you upload it here? Yes. So if you go to the official website, we have a timetable. Friday morning. Go to timetable. Friday morning. Friday morning. It should be black <laughs> hole <laughs> and <laughs> actually in my title. Okay, this is okay. We have a bad time. So this is morning. Morning. We have so many other things. Not, 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 not just the top, the top meeting. Was it Friday morning? Mm. Here. Set. Okay. This there. His last name. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I saved the trigger, so it's okay. Huh? Uh, Not to here? Uh, uh, Gregory. Uh, okay. Okay, we have six. Is it okay? Uh, can you say presentation and uh, You don't want to use your laptop? Uh, if it works, I think no. Waste time. Six. It is not what the hand say. It is not morning, it is afternoon. Yes, I told. Is it right on? It, it is my local directory. It's afternoon. Or then the same one. Maybe. Uh, uh, maybe you should you should add, add the uh, video from here. I think it is find, uh, trying to find path from your laptop, and the, the, the path here is not existing. So maybe that particular, uh, yeah, subscribers? After can again. Wait a minute, I will take. Uh, no, she will. No, she will. Okay. I don't know why she the auto arrows are like messed up. Not in your door. Okay, here. This one, yes? We can just delete this and upload another from local one. Delete and how we should edit. Insert, yes? Picture, video, photo album, in your Video, video, I think it's it's better solution, yes. Just uh, we are starting. I think it's not working. Yeah. No, no, no. I realize you can do like this. Not. It is playing, but seems not working. Let it change. Oh. Okay, okay. Maybe may I check on the big one? No, I can't. No, no. Load down. Oh, pass. Now I think it will. You have to come out of the presentation mode. Come out. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay. But in the in this mode it will work. Let's let's anyway save file. Okay. Let's open the PPT of the um um PPT convert the PPT. Okay. Third one. Yeah, this one. This PDF. This PDF. Ah. So maybe before lunch one more I'll just check if everything. Like just come before our <laughs> living. So Yeah, yeah, more than that.
First of all, I would like to thank organizers for this excellent possibility to deliver this talk here and participate in this conference in general. I am going to speak about uh, the problem, which is, uh, frankly speaking, far from realistic astrophysics, but is of uh, significant interest from the theoretical viewpoint in my view. It is based on new mm, consideration of the Penrose process. Uh, this process was uh, discovered by Penrose many years ago. Uh, recently, we celebrated 50 years of his famous paper. And it consists in the fact that the particle in the ergosphere a black hole can decay to two fragments in such a way that one on of fragment goes to the orbit with negative energy and the other one returns to infinity with larger energy. And uh, there is also analogy of this process for waves. This amplification of uh, waves in the background of rotating black holes. This is some uh, basic papers on this subject. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, one of interesting applications of continuations of this phenomena is the existence in, 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 in principle, at least theoretically, black hole bomb. So if one places a mirror around black hole, then after some uh, reflections from this shell, from this wall, energy can uh, amplify greatly, uh, being uh, concentrated in finite vo volume. There are two different versions of it. Uh, if the mirror around black hole is concave, or the mirror around the hole is convex. Both works and predict uh, uh, that such a significant, even exponential amplification is possible in principle. But as strange as it seems, uh, the process with particles for such a version of the Penrose process was not considered until recently. And uh, in this year, the paper by Kubu with Hofes appeared uh, where it was called confined Penrose uh, process. So there is some reflecting shells and particles that move inside this shell. They analyzed the uh, correspondence scenario and found that energy in this constraint volume can grow, but not indefinitely. There is some limit, and as a result, there is no black hole bomb. But, but it was noticed later that if we change a bit scenario, then in these settings, uh, black hole bomb becomes possible. Before going to just this mechanism, I would like to stress that uh, there is analog of the classical Penrose process connected with uh, charged particles and charged black holes, and it is the main subject of my talk. It was found in these papers, and uh, 
it turns out that although uh, in the rational north term uh, metric, there is no uh, ergosphere in the geometrical sense. So outside the horizon, G theta theta does not change sign. Nonetheless, there is some effective or generalized ergo region in which uh, negative energies of particles are indeed possible. I omit details which can be found in this papers. So let's start from the simplest problem. We have a rational North metric, and uh, for simplicity, we restrict ourselves by radial motion only. And this, I wrote equations of motion, which also has an additional constraint that is quantity x is positive because this uh, derivative should be positive, so-called for forward in time condition. And uh, there are different cases here. Let uh, the system have a turning po point where momentum vanishes. Then uh, one can find algebraic this value. In what follows, we uh, interested in the case when the energy is larger than mass, so epsilon is greater than one. In general, uh, particle decay to, for, to two frag fragments, see, and we assume the conservation law in the point of decay. And uh, then for given uh, values of masses and charges and initial energy, we can find algebraic from the conservation law, uh, the concrete value of this X is this, it has the meaning of generalized momentum and kinematic momentum. And now, for simplicity, let us concentrate on the decay in the turning point. Then in the uh, formulas which I wrote above, it follows this relationship. And also this relationship as well. So geometrically, we place the reflecting shell some, uh, somewhere outside the horizon, and uh, we assume that the decay occurs in the point between the horizon and, and the shell. So uh, particle zero turns into particle one and particle two. Particle one falls in the black hole, particle two moves outside, uh, towards the shell, reflects, again decay, decays, and so on. For simplicity, it is assumed that decay is, is, is happening in the same point R naught. Then it follows from the conservation law, the chain of equalities. And enumerates, uh, this is number of decay. So if you want to have negative energies, then it requires some constraints on charge, and we obtain this uh, equality. Obviously, um, the mass is uh, smaller than initial one, uh, but we have also uh, the free parameter the charge, electric charge of particle and each stage of decay. And the result depends on it crucially. If uh, the limiting value is finite, then energy in this limit is finite as well. So we have two main scenarios. The first scenario was developed by Kokubu at this office, they assumed that at uh, stage n, q with this number is uh, 
is proportional to the, to, to the mass. So the ratio of Q m Q, Q to m is a constant. And it, al it is also assumed that at each stage, the same fraction of mass is, uh, comes out from the decay. And then one obtains the limited, uh, oh, sorry. So they found uh, explicit expressions for charge at each stage, and it turns out that the limit is finite. Uh, so in, in, in doing so, the, the mass tends to zero and, and tends to infinity, so uh, particles become more and more they look like uh, photons. And the efficient, there is some efficiency which is greater than one, but is finite. So uh, there is no block hole bomb found. But now let us uh, change the scenario. Here it, it is reason, uh, this, this concrete scheme is, is presented. Beta one is some constant. Beta 2 is also constant, and it follows from the conservation law is equality, and we assume that beta 1 is negative. Then again, we find energy uh, at the end st stage number n, and one of this expression can be negative if uh, some, if this equality holds. And uh, m moreover, we can require this equality from the very beginning, then already in the first, after the first decay, we obtain negative energy. But in principle, it is not necessary. Uh, it is sufficient uh, to have this possibility starting from some uh, finite m. And in this case, as beta is uh, larger than one, and alpha is less than one, one. when n tends to in, in infinity, this equality is full, fulfilled, and uh, one of energy tends to negative value, and part, for particle which uh, tends to uh, move to, 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 to the shell, and, and, and energy uh, grows with even uh, number. It becomes unbounded, and so in the sense we have a black hole bomb. Until now, I discussed only the static case when particles move radially. But in principle, we can consider in, this, in the same manner uh, physically more realistic case. For rotating black holes. And because of shortage of time, I also report the result. If uh, decay occurs again in the turning point, it turns out that there is no uh, there is no black hole bomb both in the scenario one and the scenario two it's impossible but if we relax this condition and consider decay in an arbitrary point then in principle it becomes possible it uh, amplification poses some constraints on the parameters uh, which relates the, the masses and velocities of fragments. In, in, in principle, there is no objection against it. it uh, there is also another type of energy process due to uh, no, not uh, black, black hole, but make singularity, but unfortunately, I don't have time to report it. Uh, 
So let me summarize the result. First, the possibility of black hole bomb for Western North Stream depends crucially on type of scenario. For some scenarios, it's possible. Uh, for other not. Uh, for for uh, for rotating black holes with nitrite uh, nitro particles, black hole bomb is impossible um, for any scenario if decay occurs in the turning point. But if we relax the condition of decay in the turning point and choose some other point, uh, then a bomb again becomes possible uh, with some constraint on parameters of debris after decay. Uh, physically, there is some difference between static charge case and rotated one. It is connected with the potential barrier uh, which is sensitive to the angular momentum for rotating, but it is uh, fixed uh, when the when we deal with static black holes and in uh, their ideal motion. The crucial point for the existence of this black hole is the ergosphere. So actually by itself the horizon is formally not ma mandatory. In, in principle it applies to any system with ergo region. Uh, I understand that it is not astrophysically Process, but to my mind, it is it's it's important for understanding of uh, possibilities uh, open due to the Penrose process, both in rotating and static charge uh, space times. Oh, thank you. your model using existing observation constraints on black hole operation uh, uh, I don't think so as I said this is theoretical model so uh, both I and my predecessor don't pretend for some realistic uh, comparison with data but usually if some non trivial effect is possible in H E. Well, that is some yes. Okay. 
each of the existing compounds is much bigger than the energy without time. And that, of course, the process does not work as it seems. We will soon publish this. Is it already in the archive? Thank you very much. Indeed, this is a very non trivial issue. But here, mm, back reaction is neglected. So yes. this is zero, zero approximation. Yes, this is precisely my point. Maybe after some n. Okay, I, I will look in. Anyway, the Penrose process does exist. You, you agree? It exists, uh, but they neglected the reducible mass scheme. And this makes the process impossible. Uh, and in, in your papers on the 70s, you, 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 you did not take into account this. No. We, we decided to take it into account later. Uh -huh. Thank you. It's very, very, very important point. Yes. Yes. Thank you. 
important uh, quickly. This uh, the seminar uh, first uh, being produced by uh, Chris Pizzurro and uh, Peter Rubini. Also, the Hawking in get the link between the such area and uh, the irreducible mass. For for different uh, for, uh, physics process, this quantity changes in different ways. For for the here I do the uh, energy extraction or the under the particle process under the normal creation. This this is three different uh, physical process. The irreducible mass. Sorry, here not show sure here. The the. The irreducible mass always uh, uh, increase, but uh, in this uh, phasic process has different uh, uh, ways uh, for the uh, mass to change. The, for the energy extraction, the, the mass will decrease, but uh, for the particle process, it mass will keep constant. For the low mole creation, this uh, quantity will uh, increase. Uh, here we show the uh, from this figure. The left side, uh, the blue one is the initial value. After the uh, phasic process, the uh, mass and will change. The irreducible mass also will change. Uh, in, in the following, we will only focus, uh, mainly focus on the energy extraction, but uh, I also will uh, uh, briefly discuss about uh, the creation process and its uh, feedback on the irreducible mass. Uh, as you hear, the, for the energy extraction, and I, for the initial uh, per, uh, mentioned by, uh, the, the introduced by Pernos, they the only consider the change of the mass. They didn't consider its feedback on the irreducible mass. So oh, many researchers assume that uh, or oh, the energy extracted, all, all the, this uh, blue part uh, energy can extract it, but it's not correct because uh, uh, in, the, in this process, uh, the mass will decrease, but in the same time, at the same time, the reducible mass will change. So oh, the extracted part uh, will shrink. So the totally extracted energy will be less than this part. Uh, in order to illustrate the uh, Penrose process, it needs the tools, it uh, needs the basic equation. Uh, here we show the effective potential. The effective potential means the particle can only move above this uh, uh, effective, pen effective potential. And uh, if uh, at, a uh, at this uh, curve, it means uh, at a turning point. And uh, they, this set of equation to or covering the uh, decay process. The first one is for the energy conservation, and the, the second one and the third one is for the momentum conservation, and the, the last one, um, we assume that uh, the decay point at the turning point, just a sim simply assumption. So with uh, this question and uh, the Effective potential, we show the example of the Penrose process. It, it's a, uh, a particle from the infinite to go into the black hole. At the turning point, we assume that it decay to two particles. The zero particle decay to the point, uh, the particle one going into the black hole and uh, with negative energy. And uh, particle two, particle two uh, going out uh, Go, go out from the black hole. The, the energy of the particle two is uh, larger than the uh, particle or zero, so it has potentially extracted the energy from the black hole. But uh, uh, this is all the topic, uh, but uh, 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 up to now, no work uh, consider uh, the particle one going into black hole, it can um, feed back on the uh, black hole. It will change the mass black hole, they will change the angular momentum of black hole, so it therefore will uh, change the irreducible of the black hole. 
uh, in the beginning, we in, we in, uh, introduce the uh, math formula. So from this from that uh, math formula, we can solve the uh, irreducible math uh, as a function of uh, mass and angular momentum. So for the extreme curve by hole, uh, the irreducible mass is uh, equal to mass over square root of two, and uh, the uh, change from this equation, we can calculate uh, the change of the uh, irreducible mass uh, is uh, uh, the final final quantity minus the initial quantity. Here we show the uh, example of the this uh, uh, process as a uh, function of uh, the particle one. All, all this discussion we have shown that uh, uh, the particle is a test particle, but uh, uh, it still uh, has uh, the effect of the mass of the particle one. The first curve is the mass of the ratio between mass of particle one and uh, the mass of black hole. And uh, the, this quantity is the, the ch change of the this is quantity. And the final curve is the uh, ratio between the change of irreducible mass and the change of the uh, mass. When the particle particle becomes smaller and smaller, uh, this uh, quantity of course becomes smaller and smaller. But uh, the ratio between the irreducible mass and uh, the uh, change of the mass become larger and larger. When the particle one be turn to zero, this ratio turn to infinity. It means highly irreversible. So, so we, we not only show the example, we, but also we have give the uh, mathematical improvement. We have proved that uh, uh, the irreducible mass, change of irreducible mass is always larger than the change of mass for the uh, extreme curve black hole. But uh, for non-extreme curve black hole, it's uh, not always uh, true for this theorem. Uh, because for the small part, uh, when the uh, spin the head uh, A means the dimensionless quantity of the spin parameter, spin. When the spin larger than the long point nine two, the this ratio can can less than one. So, oh, but for the extreme curve black hole, this ratio always larger than one. Here we we only consider this a larger than one over square root of two, uh, because uh, if uh, we can consider the smaller value of the A, this uh, effective potential, the peak of the effective potential will outside of the angle sphere, so the Penrose process not, uh, cannot happen. But uh, that's because we, we simply assume that uh, the decay point at the turning point. And also, oh, we have uh, uh, considered the, the creation feedback on the irreducible mass. The creation, uh, we just uh, simply assume that the particle fall into black hole along the innermost uh, the so called orbit. It's interesting, uh, uh, this ratio has a peak around uh, the, the long point, point 0.998. They have peak and uh, uh, go the a equal to or the extreme value, or it's uh, this ratio become square root of two. It means the uh, the black hole uh, will become stable because uh, it means the black hole cannot uh, the spin of the black hole cannot uh, 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 increase further. It will become stable. Uh, but the hair have a peak, they have a peak and uh, uh, go, goes down. Uh, so I just uh, have a conclusion. Uh, we use the Penrose process as an example or to, to find that uh, the energy traction can have a significance on the irreducible mass, especially for the extreme curve black hole. 
can result in high irreversibility in this process. For the irreducible, the, uh, the feedback on the irreducible mass is a very also very important in the other process like polar process, energy extraction, and uh, uh, normal equation. So uh, our result uh, also sh sh uh, also implies that uh, the total energy can be extracted from black hole is no other than previously expected because uh, the the extractive extraction process can decrease the mass, but in the same time it can increase the irreducible mass. So the the transformable part, the extracted part, can the 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 extracted part will shrink, so it can not uh, the totally part can extract it. So uh, that's what science. Yes, I think it it can attract the more energy, but uh, the uh, feedback on the irreducible mass is also very important because it if they change the mass and they change the angular momentum, it uh, uh, therefore it will change the irreducible mass. As as long as the irreducible mass increase, the attracted part can shrink. So only part of the energy can extract it. I mean, I mean, uh, oh, oh, uh, I mean, uh, in previous study, you assume that uh, all this blue part uh, energy can be extracted, uh, but uh, the irreducible mass always can increase. So the extracted part uh, can show it.
Okay. You may talk, I uh, will propose uh, a novel interpretation of a black hole entropy and the crystal dolorophine is reducible mass in terms of a language of a wild curvature. There are many different approaches uh, to the concept of entropy. In thermodynamics, uh, entropy is a quantity whose value cannot decrease in time. In statistical mechanics, uh, entropy is a measure of the amount of disorder versus the order in a system, and also a quantification of a possible different uh, microscopic realizations of the same macroscopic system. Entropy arises also in the context of information theory. And uh, more interestingly for us, uh, we can uh, assign a notion of entropy also to the gravitational field uh, if uh, we follow the work of Hawking and Bekenstein. Hawking has demonstrated uh, the never decrease uh, area theorems, uh, and therefore uh, the area of the event horizon uh, are a good notion uh, for black hole entropy from uh, the thermodynamical uh, perspective. Bekenstein followed uh, a completely different approach uh, because uh, he have derived uh, black hole entropy from uh, as the Shannon information entropy. So as a quantification of a number of different possible microstate uh, hidden by the horizon and to which uh, we don't have information about, we are ignorant about, but consistent with the same macroscopic realization of a black hole with the same mass and electric charge. Approach is completely different, but remarkably, it turned out that again, Entropy is the horizon area. And if uh, we have a faith uh, in data collection uh, and analysis about uh, gravitational waves, uh, it uh, seems uh, that uh, this theorem are consistent also with the merging of two black holes. I think uh, that Bekenstein was very precise uh, in uh, teaching us uh, what is uh, the physical meaning of a black hole entropy. Because in Bekenstein's paper, it is explained that the black hole entropy is the entropy of a pure gravitational field. And it should not be confused with the entropy of a matter field possibly existing outside the event horizon. In fact, uh, we should also recall in this context uh, the teaching uh, from John Wheeler. In general relativity, we can have a mass without having matter and gravitational entropy refers uh, to the mass, not uh, to the matter. And uh, this can be very well uh, understood, uh, recalling uh, the vacuum Schwarzschild solution. It is an empty space-time solution of general relativity. So no matter field, but a mass, uh, and indeed uh, we have an entropy related to its horizon, even for there is no matter. So we need uh, to understand uh, why black hole entropy is an area rather than a volume, which would be expected naively from a textbook called physics. However, there is also another possible approach to the area of, uh, of event horizon. In fact, uh, Cristo Dulu and Ruffini introduced the notion of irreducible mass when distinguishing between <laughs> Okay, when uh, distinguishing between reversible and irreversible transformations uh, of black hole physics. Okay, it uh, seems blocked. Okay. okay, from here. There is still 10 minutes to do the presentation. There is still, so you managed to finish it. Okay, 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 yes. Okay. Oh, and, uh, how to go to the next slide? Okay. And uh, indeed, uh, it turns out that uh, the irreducible mass, or actually its square, 
is the area of the event horizon. And actually, in the Cristo Doloro Fini paper, this was the first demonstration by adopting a physical argument that uh, the area of the event horizon cannot decrease due to reversible transformations. So again, uh, we needed to understand uh, this area. There are also some uh, cosmological motivations uh, for studying uh, gravitational entropy, which have been put on the table by Roger Penrose, uh, who proposed uh, the wild curvature hypothesis, according to which uh, the wild tensor uh, should be a good measure of the gravitational entropy. And according to him, uh, the Big Bang singularity should come uh, with uh, zero wild curvature, so very low entropy, and the entropy increases during the evolution of the universe due to the formation of astrophysical structures and the universe becoming inhomogeneous. And uh, there is also a huge increase of uh, entropy during uh, the collapse of a star into a black hole. Therefore, it seems that the Big Bang and black hole singularities are different uh, when interpreted and uh, when looked at uh, in the language of entropy, because uh, the Big Bang singularity has a very low entropy. Big Bang, sing sorry, black hole singularity have uh, a very huge amount of entropy. I would like, uh, as a technical remark, uh, to recall that the uh, Riemann curvature, which is the full curvature in general relativity, can be decomposed uh, into the while and the Ricci part. The Ricci part is uh, its trace, and it is fixed by the Einstein equations when we impose, when we demand some matter constant. The while curvature is not fixed instead by the Einstein equations. For example, uh, Kerr and Schwarzschild are both vacuum, so the same Ricci curvature, but they are different by their while curvature. However, implementing the wild curvature hypothesis does not seem a so trivial task. For example, we inspected a proposal by Clifton, Ellis, and Tavakol, who proposed as well that the density of gravitational entropy depends on the electric part of a wild tensor, but you can see, according to their proposal, also the pressure and the energy density of a matter field enter this formula. So I feel that this might not be the entropy of a pure gravitational field. Furthermore, in our first paper, we found that some exact literature solutions of the Einstein equation come with increasing entropy, but decreasing wild tensor in the same time interval if we follow this recipe. And therefore, it seems that following this proposal, the relationship between gravitational entropy and wild curvature does not seem so clean. Other authors have proposed the square of the wild curvature as a density of gravitational entropy. They showed that this proposal worked for Schwarzschild and Schwarzschild anti de Sitter, but not for races not from space time. And therefore, it does not come with a general applicability in black hole physics. And this seems at odds with the Bekenstein proposal, because having or not having an electric field outside the horizon, I feel it should not be relevant for a density of gravitational entropy of the degrees of freedom <laughs> hidden by the horizon. And the author proposed to rescale this density with the square of the Ricci tensor, but again, if we use Einstein equations, this is related to the density of matter field. So again, not something which is a measure of a pure gravitational field. So let me formulate the question we want to answer. We want to find a function chi that integrated in the volume region inside the horizon, it should reproduce the area of horizon. This function should depend only on the wild curvature, and the function should be possibly the same for all the static 
and spherically symmetric, possibly distorting the black hole. So we want uh, this function uh, to depend only on the wild curvature because of Roger Penrose's conjecture. We wanted to integrate uh, up to the horizon because uh, Beckenstein suggested this entropy density should be related to the degrees of freedom hidden by the horizon. We wanted to reproduce uh, the area because of Hawking, Beckenstein, also holographic principle by Tooft and Fassfield. And uh, we want uh, the same function for all possible uh, black hole solutions, again, because uh, it should not be confused uh, with the energy density outside the horizon as uh, given by Beckenstein. And according to us, uh, such a function actually exists. We discover it uh, by working uh, with a Newman Penrose formalism. So we took uh, Psi 2, which is the only non-zero while uh, scalar for a Petrov type B solution. We took uh, the Newman Penrose derivative, and uh, we found that uh, this quantity, when integrated with respect to the spatial hypersurface volume element, reproduce the horizon area. Therefore, uh, in the language uh, of Hawking and Beckenstein, this is the density of uh, gravitational entropy, while in the language of uh, Cristo Dulu and Ruffini, this is uh, the density of the uh, irreducible mass, of the energy we cannot uh, extract by reversible transformation. So our formalism is fully based on the wild curvature, and therefore this is uh, why we consider appropriate uh, as a result uh, for a density of gravitational entropy. We have not made any assumption on what the function f of r is. So for example, uh, forget about uh, the distortion for a moment. So you can see that uh, our recipe work for both uh, switched and tested nostrum space tensor. So having or not having energy density outside the horizon does not uh, trouble our problem. And if we believe also in regular black hole, of course, our formalism can be applied also to those space times. So this is the geometrical formulation, and let me spend some words about the physics. So it seems that black hole entropy and irreducible mass are related to tidal effects. So there was a, a paper by Zacharias who explained the physical interpretation of the Newman Penrose quantities. Also, it seems that the black hole entropy and irreducible mass are a property of the focusing of light rays because we can re recast our density as being the Newman Penrose spin coefficient law, which governs the expansion of a bundle of light rays. Actually, this was already noticed in a paper by Beckenstein. Beckenstein already found that uh, the change in the horizon area is specifically governed by this quantity rho, this expansion of light rays. So again, it seems that our result is consistent with E2 plus. Furthermore, it seems to us that uh, what we found is not only a numerical accident, because uh, we went back to the 1939 Tolman uh, paper. We took uh, one stellar solution. We computed uh, the entropy density according to our recipe. In this case, uh, there is no horizon. So we integrate from the center up to the location of the surface, so where the pressure is zero. And we found something smaller than the area of this surface. And this seems in agreement with the fact that the stars should have lower entropy than a black hole. So of course, much, much, we are just at the beginning of this topic of research and much, much work has to be done. So what I want to do in future is to deepen the formulation of gravitational entropy in cosmology and we want to show if or under which conditions our density of gravitational entropy is, uh, can be used for describing homogeneous universes and the phase of structure formation. 
In which case, uh, we are trying right now to prove uh, that uh, our density of gravitational entropy is increasing in the same uh, time in which uh, the, the spatial shear effects are. Because these are the two effects uh, which should be related to each other for the study in homogeneities. Let's uh, think a little bit now beyond the general relativity. Our argument is uh, completely geometrical. So, if uh, there are some black holes uh, solutions with the same symmetries, but uh, solutions uh, of other modified gravitational uh, theories, if uh, we follow our recipe, which is purely geometrical, we still find an area. Nevertheless, in many modified gravitational theories, the area is not any longer interpreted as an entropy. And therefore, it seems that our curvature quantities should be adopted as density of gravitational entropy, suggesting that in those modified alternative theories, black hole entropy seems to be a manifestation of quite different degrees of freedom rather than black holes in general relativity. For example, rotating. And any, any. any rotating. This is, uh, this is another point here because I can show you it's a mathematical problem because pragmatically these quantities are well defined also for rotating black holes. But uh, in that case, uh, you see here uh, you can factor the integral in the angle and the integral in the radial direction. So you integrate the first in the angle and then in the radial direction in spherical symmetry because all this depends just on R. Unfortunately, in rotating black hole, this, uh, this uh, lower limit on the integral depends both on R and theta. So I think you would have R square plus A square cosine of uh, square of cosine of theta equal to zero, not simply r equal to zero. And integrating simultaneously in r and theta may require some residual theorem in two dimensions, uh, which uh, we still could not uh, come up uh, with. I A lot. Uh, yeah, many things to do. Thank you. 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 Yes, of course, please share your screen, yes. What about the microphone? Is it clear now to the screen? Yes, clear, clear. Can I start my talk? Yes, please. It's a pleasure for me. It's a pleasure for me. I should do this, yes, okay. It's a pleasure for me to participate in the meeting of the work of the Arabic and the Swedish in Denmark. I will be speaking the section of the EU. Uh, and uh, excuse me, I had a virus in my computer, and for that reason, uh, I made it to the EU during the last three days when the computer failed. Now, may I start with time in Russia? I will speak about uh, Yaka Zandovich mainly and his name. Now, which is both time uh, present now on my page of uh, conferences on cosmology, observation of cosmology, and giving the I should give my talk next week on the uh, online, is on the millimeter, cosmological millimeter uh, 
Russia's strategy in general. This will be very big conference and half of the uh, conference will be watched with the uh, best that expect And I like this photo of Zeldovich because it's very unusual for me. I have seen bulk of my life Zeldovich, which was already much elder. But I met him first time when I was uh, 20. I just turned 22. And I come here. And uh, in March. And in March. And In March uh, 1965, a week before uh, Zeldovich turned 51, uh, he, we, I met him in the, I met him, uh, I, um, I heard that he is forming the group of theoretical people and looking for young people. And I was student in the, in the Institute for Exper Experiment, uh, in the, uh, I had my, uh, how to say, diploma in the Institute of Theoretical and Experimental Physics uh, in Moscow, where director was Abraham Alekhanov uh, in his lab. And, uh, but I wanted to go to theory. I went to met Zeldovich, even I never before heard about him. And we just, uh, he invited me to come. I came and uh, after Uh, I had solved a couple of small problems. Uh, Zeldovich told me that he agreed to let me to be his students, but told me if you will not do something on time or if you will be lazy, then goodbye. I will not speak with you anymore. It was very interesting, but in reality, only later, yes, I told him that I wish to do theory of fields. And he told me about uh, astro that uh, he wishes that I will do he with him astrophysics. I told that uh, I replied him that um, head of the chair uh, in um, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, where I was officially student, uh, Karen Permartirasian. Uh, told me that, Rashid, don't be unclever and don't go to astrophysics. I know exactly that this is useless science. I told this to Zeldovich. Zeldovich told, okay, but please help me with three small problems, and then we will shift to the theory of fields. I believed him. I solved these small problems, and when I came, <laughs> back to him with these problems, I told him, okay, let's do astrophysics. And so I came to astrophysics and I was, I am all these years, I, uh, I am extremely happy with this choice which Zeldovich, uh, with this door to astrophysics which Zeldovich opened for me. That time was wonderful time for astrophysics and each year was bringing new and exciting discoveries. I remember discovery of quasars, and fortunately, mm -hmm. Martin Schmidt was my friend up to the, his last days. Uh, I remember how Sir Martin Ryle discovered cosmological evolution of radio sources, and friend of mine, Malcolm Langer, was working very deeply in these directions. I remember how radio pulsars were discovered. But especially important for me, and for, I think, majority of cosmologists, was discovery of the cosmic microwave background, CMB radiation, which was predicted by George Gamow. Uh, prediction was based on some mistakes, but he predicted, and you know, everybody was expecting that there is this radiation. And Penzels and Wilson discovered this radiation in 1965, just when I came to Zeldovich. And I can tell you that this discovery showed that this radiation is uh, isotropic. It has a black body spectrum with temperature close to three degrees Kelvin. You all know about this. In June 65, this was three months later than uh, I met Zeldovich, Penzels and Wilson, uh, Wilson reported in the astrophysical journal that they discovered the CMB. I remember the seminar in the Sternberg Astronomical Institute of Moscow University. Uh, 
where somebody showed, I don't remember who was this, Ginsburg or Shklovsky, but they showed this volume of APG, which they got through British Embassy in Moscow, and were telling about, the, about this great discovery. After a brief account, people discussed this, and then I remember that Zeldovich, who was who heard about this during the seminar, but he stayed and told, "Oh, I should explain you everything. How important is this discovery?" And he told about main at that time at least important consequences of this discovery from cosmological nuclear synthesis of helium and deuterium. Uh, then he spoke, I remember, about possibility to measure cosmological dipole, and uh, it was important to distinguish this cosmological dipole from the dipole originating during the, due to the motion of uh, us as an observers relative to isotropic background. And he was telling also about the testing, the degree of the anisotropy of the universe. I was amused, I was a young student, I was amused how easily and understandable, he was speaking about extremely complicated issues. Uh, it was obvious that he, is, he was prepared to this meeting, even he didn't knew that it, this, uh, his talk should be during this seminar where uh, there will be information about great discovery. Um, and I can tell it, uh, he was during his talk enormously excited uh, speaking about all these things. Few days later, Yebe invited me to his home and invited to walk on the observational consequences following this discovery. He was walking at that time with many other people, young people, very well known now, uh, most well known, I think, Russian young astrophysicists at that time. And they were doing uh, very interesting things. Stravinsky came a few years later. They were doing, you know, inflation together. There was Bisnavati Kogan who was doing uh, nuclear, uh, how to say, nuclear problems in the stars and also high dynamics of the stars. Igor Novikov was working on uh, problems of general relativity. I was excited by Andrei Drashkevich who uh, was already using a lot computer at that time. But from that, this was very long ago. All this was in March 65. I was a uh, fifth year student in the, uh, in the institute. Uh, from then on, for almost 25 years, until the last days of life of his men, of my mentor, I was one of his collaborators. And we were in very close scientific contact practically, practically every day. Usually he was calling me practically every day, and we met at least twice per week. I can tell you that the crucial thing was that he strongly supported my involvement in the theory of accretion onto black holes and neutron star, and supported, for example, our paper uh, with Nick Shakura, as you know, this uh, paper is uh, maybe the most cited in the world theoretical astrophysics. Uh, it's pity that Nick is not also is unable due to health problems, uh, was unable to fly to Yerevan. I had conversation with him before these conferences. And I should mention also that Yebe helped me to create the Department of High Energy Astrophysics at the key, which was responsible for the preparation and science coming uh, from the observatory Rengen on the module quant docked to the space station Mir. At that time, we were able to detect uh, hard X-rays from the uh, down, uh, how to say, down containerization of photons, uh, of gamma ray photon, photons from the cobalt 56 decay into normal iron. We were working on orbital observatories, Granat, Integral, and Spectre RG now. And you know, it was very difficult to get four successful proton launches for these uh, missions. And 
I knew all time that Yahweh is behind me, and if it will be necessary, he will tell that this is uh, what is uh, that he has his own opinion about these signs. And I also very glad that uh, um, Yahweh was very strongly supporting the broad international collaboration in these missions. I can tell you that um, uh, preparing this talk, I thought about my life and uh, about uh, Zeldovich papers. I remember how daughter of Jakob Zeldovich um, five years ago wrote me short letter and told me that Rashid, we are watching, following the citation of Yabe, and we are amused that you are helping still to make his name alive. I am glad to see all of you and uh, just this conference, thank you to Rema. This conference also demonstrates that the uh, name of Jakob Zeldovich is alive. Uh, just before prepa prepare, preparing this talk, urgently in France, uh, I um, just looked for Zeldovich 10 most cited articles and books according to NASA astrophysics, uh, astrophysical data system uh, prepared by uh, Harvard University. And I was amused because five of the 10 most cited articles and books in astrophysics um, uh, yes, published by Yebe, are devoted to predictions of acoustic peaks in the power spectrum of CMB and to CMB energy spectrum distortions due to energy release during the evolution of the universe and the formation of large-scale structure uh, leading to the spectral distortions. And this is thermal and kinematic as that effect. You see this on the screen, these 10 papers, and I was in, and this is also a uh, number of citations. For me, it's important, obviously, this well-known paper, which everybody who is modeling today large-scale structure of the universe with dark matter, with everything what is there, are using this paper of uh, Zeldovich because it helps to save many, uh, a lot of uh, computer time. But you see it, this is a paper about uh, LZ effect, uh, paper about small scale fluctuations, uh, paper about acoustic oscillations, uh, but two books, uh, this is books of, of Zeldovich and Reiser of, uh, on elements of gas dynamics and of physics of shock waves. This is a review of microwave background radiation, again, the spectra, uh, beautiful paper of Shandarin and Zildovich on large-scale structure of the universe. Uh, our paper about, yes, paper of Zildovich cosmological fluctuations. This is the zeldovich Harrison spectrum and kinematic ascent effect, which permits, which demonstrated, uh, how to say, this is additional uh, experimental evidence today that Copernicus principle, principle is correct. I show here, you see, we were predicting um, acoustic peaks and um, baryonic acoustic oscillations. This paper of 1970, and this is the map of CMB. And you know all that this is the acoustic peaks discovered by Planck. Many peaks, it is, was predicted, and everything follows from the standing existence of standing sound waves in the early universe, which were first mentioned by uh, Lifshitz, uh, Eugene Lifshitz, in his doctoral thesis written in, okay, defended in 1946. But then we showed that because there is a uh, surface of um, uh, of the last scattering in the universe. Therefore, many different sound waves of different scales are coming to this surface with different phase. And we are getting, you know, these peaks as a result. Uh, this is great today. Uh, and Planck, papers of Planck based on this effect, uh, which are giving us the all 
um, all most key important constants of the universe. Um, uh, these papers, now three papers, they have uh, all together 29,000 citations. It's an unbelievable success of Planck spacecraft, and we discussed a lot this uh, during uh, conference in uh, on the Mediterranean uh, coast of France, devoted to Jean-Luc Puget, who is who was the key person in the high-frequency instrument on Planck, which made these great discoveries. Uh, we have dream at the same time. We with Zeldovich, we propose that it is possible to see the uh, recombination effect, and that recombination is. Uh, how to say, ruled by 2s decay of h uh, of h to uh, s level. It was very interesting. This is better than uh, stronger effect at the time of uh, decoupling of radiation and plasma. Um, uh, that this um, recombination is ruled by this 2s decay and. We were first who told that mu distortions will be very important at redshift from 10 power 5 to 10 power 6, just up to the black body photosphere of the universe at redshift 2 millions. It's unbelievable that all these things was possible ideologically and find solution for this by Zeldovich and students in 1970. This is Zeldovich, as I remember him, because this he is when he is already in his 60s. And uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, when I, I never, I told you that when we first I met, I never cared about him. And the reason was these three stars, as you know, he was the not very well advertised person before. But now I think people in the whole world know his name both for the, his contribution to ecology, his contribution to, cons to consumption, to combustion, his contribution to the uh, new nuclear physics and elementary particle physics, but also for astrophysics. And this is picture how we were understanding as that effect at that time. You see photons are moving uh, due to uh, scattering on, hot, on thermally hot electrons, just Thomson scattering and just Doppler effect, nothing. Then effect is such that photons are moving to higher frequency. And in religions part, there is a shadow on the sky in the places where, um, where should be hot gas, uh, which people thought at that time is feeling the clusters of galaxies. There were no one observation of hot gas yet at that time. And this is typical cluster of galaxies. It's HST got it much later. And you see cluster of galaxies. Thousands of galaxies are moving with velocities of 1,000 kilometers per second. And uh, gas, which is in the same potential well, has temperature, enormous temperature with uh, 3 to 10 keV, and uh, galaxies are moving with sonic, subsonic, supersonic velocities in, the, in this gas. And you see this, uh, it is beautiful thing, and uh, it was very interesting that uh, first observation of a that effect immediately found that new discovered clusters uh, have the uh, have, are working like gravitational lenses and amplify uh, very distant galaxies. And now about Planck again. Planck spacecraft was enormously important for us. I hope that you see on the screen this image of the uh, that shadow in the direction to coma cluster where Zwicky discovered presence of the, in 1930s, of the dark matter, so popular topic now. You see this as that beautiful as that map uh, of the coma cluster. I will show later uh, how we see now this X-rays from the same cluster of galaxies. And this was great result. And I was fighting 
on the science committee of Planck to publish this immediately because nobody else in the world was able to observe any cluster of galaxies with the same uh, precision as Planck did using that effect. Uh, and this another excitement, which was uh, at that time the press release of European Space Agency from Planck. It is uh, <laughs> I am glad because I provided Planck with the best channel regions where it is important to measure. And especially important was frequency 218 gigahertz, where effect should be equal to zero. At higher frequencies, it is positive, and low, there is a positive source. And in lower uh, frequencies, it is negative source. And Planck has seen these negative objects at low frequencies up to uh, 200 uh, gigahertz at 218 effect was zero. They saw nothing, you see, no cluster. And at high frequencies, this was already, again, positive source, very bright. Uh, Nabila Akhanim showed on the confer conference in Bailus in France just this old picture of Planck. This was first clusters of galaxies discovered by Planck spacecraft on the sky. Uh, first uh, release, oh, excuse me, first release was 900 Planck clusters. Finally, it was more than 2,000. And this was great discovery. Now, uh, again, people uh, told in uh, France, on this conference in France, that 16% uh, of citation on Planck are connected with these as that observations. Okay. Excuse me. I don't know. Is everything okay? Do you see me? Yes. Okay, then I can uh, show you what is occurring. I have, had, uh, I was, uh, I told you that my uh, talk disappeared in computer and computer was not working. I am giving this talk with computer of a French colleague. Uh, but Planck was not only one source. There was SPT. South Pole Telescope, which is working in a few hundred meters from Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope, just on the pole on South Pole. They discovered, John Karlstrom and his team uh, discovered more than 2,000 clusters. A uh, professor of Illinois, Vietra, uh, he on the conference told me, Rashid, and demonstrated it. You don't know what was my first discovery in the life. I was a student who seen first three clusters uh, all from SPT. You know, there is a great paper where three first clusters discovered by SPT. This was before Planck. They discovered just on the scanning the sky unknown clusters of galaxies, which became great. They, were, they had lenses and many other interests, interesting things. Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which is demolished this year, and there will be new telescope from um, Simon's Observatory on the same place, but with 60,000 kit, kids detectors working um, uh, at temperature 100 mK. Uh, and I've discovered there is catalog of 4,000 clusters, Lyman Page and Susan Stubbs, mm -hmm presented this data, and there are rumors from the same people that they have now 2,000 clusters more. I will show you in the end of the talk the greatest discovery of our student, Luca Di Mascola. It's recent paper made in Nature, uh, where ALMA, this the biggest interferometer in the world, on the height 5,000 meters, discovered the SZ signal from a hot gas in protocluster of galaxies. This first detection of how the hot gas is forming in protocluster of galaxies at redshift 2.16. Till now, the highest redshift for detection of hot gas using a Z effect was 1.75 from the SPT. I can tell you that I also plan to show you later uh, in, before the end of my talk, it's several slides more, uh, that SRG Erosita, this uh, Russian spacecraft with German and Russian telescopes, X-ray telescopes, 
after four scans of the whole sky, created the map of the whole sky in X-rays and detected now in X-rays nearly 50,000 clusters of galaxies and groups of galaxies. This unbelievable result, I can tell you this is, it's not published, but it's obvious we have them. 25 uh, on one side of the sky and 25,000 on another half of the sky. And this is absolutely great thing. We can do a lot of cosmology looking when these clusters appear, how they grow, where is the kindergarten, where is the universities, and so on. And inside the horizon, we in principle can see only 100,000 rich clusters of galaxies, according to the all present simulation and uh, and um, all present simulations and theories. And I can tell you that 50,000 are already observed in X-rays. But Simon's Observatory uh, and new results from South Pole Telescope are coming, and they promise within 10, 15 years that all clusters of galaxies in the universe will be detected. This is unbelievable uh, thing. I can show you here, I hope that you see on the uh, right corner, one of the groups of galaxies which was discovered by Erosita, uh, um, uh, board of SRG spacecraft, Spectrum Rangin Gamma spacecraft, and this is now nest uh, name galaxy group. And LOFAR observed the same region, and you see here beautiful radio structure. There is a supermassive black hole. We see it. I don't know, do you see or not uh, my, uh, I show very supermassive black hole, but it is in the center of this picture. And it provides the jets and uh, counter jets is weak. And you see the jets, which are maybe 100 times older than the jets in M87. And this is enormous because this uh, low frequency pictures uh, is extension in a radio band is more than 1.5 million light years, like M87. I already started to talk about the results of um, Spectrum Rangin Gamma mission, which we launched into the Lavochkin uh, industry, launched into the uh, L2 point of uh, Sun Earth system. And it is working at the distance 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, just very close to the place where James Webb Space Telescope uh, is working. And Gaia has much more orbit, which is much more close to the L2 point than the orbits of James Webb Telescope and uh, of Spectrum RG. It's excellent orbit. We are very happy with it. And OK. You know this. And during 31 months of the work in space of Erosita and 41, 45 months of Arctic Sea, Russian device, uh, we got a lot of interesting data. And you see here this Erosita, 808 kilograms, giant device. I remember that uh, German site wanted to give provide us with very small telescope, but I told to Günther Heisinger at that time, that Günther, we wish to see all clusters of galaxies in the universe. Why you are not helping? And Günther found, he told, but this will be a lot of weight, a lot of power, and a lot of other things. I told, this is not your question, it's question to engineers in Lauchkin. And everything was done. This is huge device produced in, uh, in Germany, uh, and spacecraft navigator platform made in Lavochkin industry near Moscow. And there is Arctic Sea, which is made in Sarov, in uh, Russian nuclear center, where Zeldovich worked many years. But mirrors, X-ray mirrors, Russian mirrors were not ready on time. Uh, Marshall Space Flight Center supplied for this Russian uh, telescope Arctic Sea, and they are working perfectly, but in uh, more hot X rays. It's interesting that we were from the beginning very motivated to find clusters of galaxies at 
high redshift. And that high redshift, one megaparsec from for redshift of, from uh, 0 0.5 to, for example, two, all clusters of galaxy, or oh, one megaparsec is of the order of one arc minute. Therefore, we wanted to have an energy re the resolution, angular resolution, better than, than one arc uh, minute. In reality, it is angular resolution of Erosita is 25 arc second, and uh, one pixel on uh, extra CCD is nine to nine arc seconds. Therefore, in reality, we know for bright X-ray sources, their position with precision better than five arc seconds on the sky. This helps enormously. We can correlate our uh, our results with data from ALMA and immediately separate X-rays from of st star uh, stellar origin from X-rays from extragalactic origin. This is beautiful spacecraft and many thanks to industry which was able to produce it and to launch in the right to the right orbit. This is the result. You can see the first SRG All Sky Survey, which allowed to con uh, to construct the uh, image of the sky in uh, which was eight times uh, which contained eight times more x-ray sources than the former uh, best map of the sky this was the map created by a him trumper group on rosat but i can tell you that three quarters of all objects here are quasars super massive uh, are creating supermassive black holes. We see now today, we see more than 2 million quasars on the sky. This is our plane of our galaxy, and it is dark in X-rays because there is a gas which is absorbing, uh, absorbing soft X-rays. Therefore, it is very dark. And we see also huge uh, traces of activity of uh, central part of our galaxy, which was occurring 50 or 60 uh, million years ago. It's enormous activity, and what is uh, we are able, Erosita has very good spectral resolution, and we have map of this region in different, in the lines of the different element in uh, helium and hydrogen uh, like ions of oxygen in uh, helium and hydrogen magnesium lines, silicon lines, you know, it is beautiful. Second shell of iron, we see iron lines also, and whole structure and velocities is possible to observe. And for future mission with microcalorimeters, I think it is will be enormous. They can find what are the velocities in any points on this structure just using the just using the extra spectra uh, we see also of the order already on this um, on on this uh, map we saw of the order of 15000 clusters of galaxies which was impossible for um, for rosat rosat observed several clusters therefore and of the order of, finally we have of the order of 500 galactic stars which are emits which emit also in x-rays i told you about uh, this how one megaparsec at different redshift 100 of uh, redshift uh, 0.1 1 2 3 5 everybody who studied cosmology knows that there is a minimum and one arc minute is characteristic angular dimensions from redshift point three to redshift three for one megaparsec um, uh, co-moving um, co -moving angular dimension. Yes, now the clusters of galaxies. We are observing these clusters of galaxies, the biggest in the world, in our universe, gravitationally bound objects. And you see that they are not point objects. We see how gas, these are just what we see, how distribution of photons you immediately see that they are very big. And this is of the order of, uh, how to say, one arc minute, you see. But a total field here is of the order of one degree or one half a degree. And 
we see really because we see the so many tens of thousands of objects we can follow if we know redshift using optical uh, observations we can say what is uh, how the growth of large scale structure occurred how these clusters were measured marat gilfanov gave me his response uh, his head of the catalog group uh, of um, erosita for half of the sky and he is showing in the first half a year survey of the whole sky we discovered on half of the sky uh, 10000 clusters with uh, four sigma uh, since how to say with brighter than four sigma uh, and uh, for the five sigma it will be 7500 when we took two surveys first and second it was 14,000 and 19,000 of the half as a sky. One, two, three, you see values up to 25,000 clusters. And one, two, three, four, we had 23 and 31 for this four sigma, 31,000 clusters on half of the sky. I can tell you we have additional 0.4. Uh, of sky survey and all together even five sigma exceeds uh, amount of clusters detected uh, in yes is higher than 25,000 we are very very happy and we look for the dipole uh, type um, features uh, on the sky due to the, the, the distribution of clusters of galaxies. We have a lot of statistics. We hope to see baryonic acoustic oscillations. I told you, promised you to show the coma cluster. It is, this is a Planck picture. It is uh, right on the right. In the middle, you see the Erosita picture and Erosita again, uh, which was uh, for majority of X-ray instruments impossible to see, but Erosita saw uh, sees the merging of the group of galaxies. You see it uh, on the uh, how to say uh, right uh, in the bottom uh, group of galaxies, and this is coma cluster itself. It's beautiful result, and this is Arctic Sea. It sees at higher energy from four to fifteen keV, but much more central part of the object. I have no time to describe you all consequences which we got from these observations of coma. Uh, just analyzing, this was a long time ago when Viklinin and Churazov, uh, they found that the ratio of Y parameter of this strength of a Z effect uh, in the Planck as Z map to the X-ray surface brightness of Erosita opens the possibility to look for the distribution of temperature for the whole coma. It is just the ratio, KT, KT is the ratio. And you see the distribution here or between group and uh, cluster of galaxies, uh, we see that very low temperature in the bridge, we see low tem temperature gas. It is 2 keV temperature. And in the central part of coma, temperature is increasing up to 16 keV. You see here, it is 16 keV. And this is just ratio of signal in the uh, radio, in the millimeters to the signal negative, uh, how to say, shadow uh, to the X-ray emission. We were very glad to get this result. And this is, I think, enormously important picture here you see the flattened image where you decreased brightness the object is too bright to show this effect and then you see but in parallel how to say proportionally and you see the trajectory of ngc 4839 group it went with supersonic velocity through the central part of coma then made the how to say the turn around and now is moving back and it is beginning of merging after two three such uh, flyby uh, they, this will become a, it will increase its mass we will see this but what is beautiful here we see the primary shock due to motion of this group we see it as a jump or in the density and temperature of the gas 
Then we see the secondary shock. You see, it is much better visible here. We see the breach of the uh, cold gas between two group and galaxy. And we see here uh, contact discontinuity. Whole picture of hydrodynamics is here. And people were asking me several times, Rashid, how, what is the characteristic time you're showing us? And characteristic time for this picture, for these high dynamical processes is of the order of billion years. And you see everything as in the normal lab and how the uh, people who are working on the aviation or rocket high dynamics, they have similar effects. And the last slide, I have many slides to show, but uh, I showed here much more on the conference, but uh, okay, uh, I, I show you the result obtained by our former student, um, uh, Luca Di Mascola in MPA. Um, he now is in, working in Trieste, uh, in the, yes, and you see here the spider web galaxy. This is, this is the picture of Hubble, small group of galaxies, and we found that spider web galaxy, Dimascola and his colleagues, big group of people, using ALMA, giant, giant uh, radio telescope at five kilometers, they found the image of the hot gas with temperature several keVs, which is forming proto-cluster of galaxies around galaxy, well-known galaxies via spider web. This recent paper in Nature uh, in May, uh, published in May in Nature, and there were a lot of tens of uh, press releases connected with this. But it's interesting that, again, we see types of filaments around how the uh, dark matter is entering and how hot gas is compressed and also falling into the gravitational well, uh, which is growing. You know, it's beautiful image and absolutely great data. And I am, again, very proud. New papers of nature, I can, uh, last year it were three papers only from Alma. They are coming, and all of them uh, have name of Jakob Zoldovich. And I can tell you that uh, not only I, I hope that many his students and colleagues, they were enormously happy that they met in their life and were working together with this great person. And his name is, as his daughter Olga wrote to me, his name is Alive, and astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology helped his name to be very well known for young scientists. Everybody of them now is learning uh, these uh, things like uh, thermal and kinematic effect um, uh, in the courses of theoretical astrophysics and cosmology. I should mention also that they this result immediately when they detected this effect and told to me, I told boys, and what is upper limit to uh, kinetic as that effect? What will be the velocity with which this whole cluster is moving relative to uh, microwave background at redshift 2.16? And answer was, yes, Rashid, it is less than 700 kilometers per second. Upper limit today is 700 kilometers per second that, uh, that the, this supercluster as a whole is moving at that huge redshift, which is going uh, recession velocity is close to velocity of light, and it is in the rest relative to microwave background there at redshift 2. This is enormously additional uh, confirmation of Copernicus principle. And I also glad that during conference devoted to 550 anniversary of birthday of Copernicus, it was possible to say that there are no new, not philosophical, but experimental ways to prove that he was completely right. 
that his, uh, his um, principle is absolutely correct. Yes, this is the Irazita X-ray sky. Everybody has seen this. I will show, thank you for your attention and leave this picture if there are questions to me. Thank you. I do not hear. Could you? Uh, yes, we we have seen uh, this uh, beautiful uh, image of this young uh, Dimascolo. I think is an Italian young uh, scientist, and um, it's just marvelous. We would like to use this uh, as uh, uh, propaganda for uh, the next uh, MG seventeen. We are, we are uh, uh, really very excited by your presentation from the history to the latest results. And, uh, and uh, it's really fantastic the number of class, class, clusters that have been discovered and the Shunyayev Zendorich effect. I, I, we are discussing quite a lot uh, about the next Marcel Grossman meeting in Beijing. And uh, I hope that you are in favor of having the meeting there and you will participate. What is, uh, uh, I assume that. And we yeah, well, thank you for invitation. I can say only one question is only uh, the health. Other six are fine. I will be glad to be in Beijing. But uh, I, I wanted to be in Yerevan, but uh, this was birthday, uh, 75th uh, anniversary, how to say, 75, uh, 75th birthday of Jean-Luc Puget, who created HFI device, and I spent a lot of time uh, pushing the plank. It was very difficult to do, and for me... I knew that Planck was crucial for the science which Zeldovich did, and uh, I was here to congratulate uh, Jean-Luc with uh, yes. his birthday. You know Jean-Luc Puget. We, we, we hope very much that uh, after this meeting in Yerevan, we consider this a little bit uh, a moment like the Noé Arch here. Hundred scientists have been working for uh, all the week. There have been very beautiful presentation by all, uh, all uh, also your former uh, student, but also we had uh, a very splendid uh, uh, presentation by the people at the Space Telescope Institute with yes. the first image of James Webb. As yes. you the space Maximo, Maximo gave a great talk. I met him several uh, Months, uh, two months ago, and we had long conversations. I think mm -hmm. that uh, it is great that uh, people from Jace Web Telescope also were participating. I have seen the program. I was uh, wishing to follow, but uh, it is first time in my life that during the just uh, when I came to the conference, my uh, computer got virus. Yes, I understand. I was unable. Uh, even but, email contact was, uh, everything was out. But uh, the reason we are especially uh, happy is that uh, uh, the Sp uh, Space Telescope Institute is uh, an ICRA member, and uh, we are looking for a new activity together with Space Telescope on James Webb. And uh, I would like very much them to be present also in the meeting in, uh, in Beijing. Therefore, uh, but let me tell you something new which has uh, uh, come out. We are uh, really very, very interested in the far away um, GRB because yes. we have understood something fundamental as a, <laughs> of a GRB as E9.2. And there is completely new physics that we are explore, exploring these hours. The other point, which was made, we have here Felix Mirabel, is the possibility that the large black holes of 10 to the 10 solar masses at Z equal 10, which are now found uh, quite many from James Webb, not only the mega black hole that you are observing, but especially 
de Edouard Naranzi Qualten, they could really have a change of paradigm in cosmology. Therefore, all these points we are going to follow even uh, next week in Pescara, and uh, we, will, uh, we will keep in touch with you to have more feedback from next week. And for the moment, let me just thank you for this formidable presentation. I, I've been discussing quite a lot with Marat yes. Gilfadov yes. about the object that we were supposed to take to, to, uh, to Iki. And I have shown here the object. People were all very pleased. But I think uh, the, the meeting in Armenia is not the right place. And we would like to present officially with the wish that in these next 12 months, Erosita will be operative again, and you will present in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Beijing the, the new results. And this will be really a triumph. And at that occasion, we will uh, give uh, the statue uh, to the people of Iki coming there in Beijing to celebrate the many day, splendid result you are obtaining. This will be very, very meaningful. OK, therefore, thank you very much for everything. Let's work, keep working very much. Lyman Page, uh, we have to englobe him in uh, all our activity of, uh, 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 of the MG meeting. He's uh, very, very active and uh, very much close to our tradition and uh, to our activities. Yes, I uh, I saw, I, I am, uh, Lyman Page also is here. There are, you know, many, many people from CMV community. And I'm thinking we should have, a sh uh, when you go back to Princeton, we should have a, a, a one week meeting to review what is coming out in cosmology, because I am sure this latest data of uh, James Webb are really revolutionary. It's true. And, uh, and uh, if Erosita will start to operate again, it will be even more exciting. Thank you very much. And uh, from all of us, our great thanks for this splendid presentation. Thank you, Remo, and thank you, audience, for remembering Zoldovich. Bye, many thanks. Bye. Okay. So we're not, not to extend the morning session. We're going for the speakers. Yeah, we're going for the speakers. Thanks, George. Yeah. Okay. Now we will start at the three. Yes. This one. This one. Okay, we don't get one. one. So it's a test for some meeting. Right? Yeah. 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 No. Yeah, 
and check whether in the slide some mode itself works or I have to come out. In this way, I wish you to expect some amount. Anyway, I think the technology of all of this is the best idea. No, it works. Yes, it's strange. Maybe it's asked to upgrade, but if you don't upgrade, somehow it manages. Which is fine. I think then at the same time, I okay, okay. And then uh, and so I'll need I have also my pointer, but this pointer is okay, no? This one is okay, yeah. It will also be thing forward and lacking it. Sorry, can you finish? Can we not push it? Bank uh up here until you be here. Or Many, many things without to do.
Я готов. Хорошо, хорошо. Хорошо. Если ты показываешь красную кнопку пуск, то это уже серьезно. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My talk will be devoted mainly uh, to the development of the special numerical procedure which we want to apply to the pretty complicated uh, astrophysical problem, namely the problem of which is trying to explain physical mechanism of core collapse supernova explosion. One of the most promising uh, mechanisms of core, uh, core collapse supernova is uh, so-called magnetorotational mechanism. It was, oh, sorry, I forget this uh, first slide. This, the idea of this mechanism was suggested by uh, Bisnovati Kogan in 1970, so more than 50 years ago, and a few years later, at very, very old uh, computers, there, first, there were made first simulations, and the star looked very strange, like infinite cylinder, and the idea of magnet rotation mechanism is very simple. If you have uh, a collapsing core, if you have uh, a rotation, then due, due to non-uniform collapse, uh, non-uniform collapse, you get uh, uh, differential rotation. If you have frozen in magnetic field, that it could, uh, it will be amplified first uh, by um, uh, conservation of magnetic flux, second by the differential rotation, just uh, um, because magnetic uh, lines, uh, force lines becomes more uh, stressed, and by magnetic field it's possible to transfer part of the uh, uh, initially gravitational energy, then energy of rotation, to the energy of the explosion, namely to the uh, kin kinetic energy of radial motion. And uh, first simulations were done many years ago, as I told you, and you see here an example of the uh, force line, and the next slide, uh, this is uh, animation of this mechanism in 1D, and the difference between these three pictures is the initial strength of the magnetic field. If the initial magnetic field is very strong, then you need only few revolutions. Uh, this is the strongest magnetic field, this uh, average, and this is uh, the weakest one. 
Uh, but in the case when the magnetic field is pretty slow, slow in the sense that magnetic energy is much, much slower than the gravitational energy, like 10 to the minus uh, 10, at least no less, no more than 10 to the minus 6. Then you need many, many revolutions. And in 1D it was not a problem. In 1D the problem was solved in uh, Lagrangian coordinates. And uh, it was found that it's possible to transfer the energy to the uh, rotational energy to the energy of the explosion. Then we moved to 2D. We applied the uh, triangular grid. Uh, and you can see that, again, we have a core collapse. Now the star looks much uh, better. It's uh, like initial like a sphere, but with actual symmetry. We have a strong collapse, the concentration of the matter inside. And um, what we have uh, during the, the simulation, we have here in the central part of the computational domain where the proton-neutron star is forming, huge uh, sound speed and relatively small uh, velocity of the matter. It means that uh, Mach number uh, in, the, in this region are very uh, small. Uh, another uh, point uh, which stressed the difficulty to solve this kind of problem is the huge densities in the center uh, and huge temperatures like 10 to the 9, sometimes 10 to the 10 um, kelvins. And uh, here's an example of uh, 3D simulations. But uh, what is really uh, difficult from the computational point of view uh, is, um, I will show the formula in a few slides later, is a very small time step for the numerical method which is restricted. Uh, I think people who work with numerical simulations know that this is... Uh, uh, restriction of the time step current friedrichs levy or simply speaking current uh, restriction, which uh, looks uh, uh, very restrictive. And we construct the method, try to avoid uh, first this uh, limitation on the time step. Second, uh, when we have this different in 2D, we, we have rotation of the matter through the uh, computational plane. And no problem, and we don't care how many uh, revolutions make the, uh, the matter made, ar made around, uh, around the uh, axis. But if we come to 3D uh, simulation, then we have to follow the matter, and if we use, uh, for example, for simplicity, use uh, non-moving grid, then we uh, smooth uh, uh, the details of the flow and can lose uh, and get huge numerical errors. As I told you, the problem is uh, rotation also. And uh, in principle, it's possible to more or less to overcome this problem to use uh, cylindrical spherical coordinates. But in, in the case when the magnetic fields are physically real, when we need uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of revolutions, even in this case, uh, the so long uh, way of the matter through the computational grid still can uh, give uh, high uh, numerical errors. So the idea was to use um, quasi-Lagrangian treatment of the rotation. So our grid in 3D, it's uh, in spherical or in cylindrical coordinates, contains or consists of uh, rings. And we allow for every ring to rotate with its own velocity. A uh, few slides, slides later, I'll show you a simple cartoon explaining the situation. This idea is not new. It was realized in these codes. The only problem that uh, in these codes, uh, uh, this approach was uh, uh, used in, so to say, discrete uh, approach. So one uh, ring uh, moved in relation to another ring discreetly, jumping from the cell to cell. In our case, these rings rotate smoothly, one uh, with uh, averaged uh, velocity. Uh, in principle, it's, so to say, quasi-Lagrangian approach which allows us to uh, to uh, eliminate the majority of the rotation of the movement of the matter due to rotation uh, from the grid. As I told you, here is a, a pretty simple formula for the time uh, limitation of its current uh, condition. Here you, it's for spherical coordinates, but in principle, important point is the in, uh, in the upper part of this uh, uh, remember, you can see the size of the cell. In the lower part, you can see the velocity plus uh, sound velocity. And in the case when sound velocity is very high, then we can move uh, pretty fast enough. We need to make to make huge uh, number of time steps and um, lo 
lose the accuracy. But we need to, to uh, follow pretty long evolution uh, of uh, magnetic field. Physically speaking, we have a problem with two different uh, time scales, acoustic and magnetic time scales. Uh, and what to do in this case, how to overcome this problem? The idea was to apply so-called uh, semi-implicit conservative method, which uh, we realized, and uh, to avoid uh, this uh, very strong restriction which appears near the uh, and in the forming neutron star, we, uh, uh, because we use, when we use semi-implicit approach, we remove this restriction, we remove uh, sound velocity uh, from this formula, and this time step becomes much higher. Of course, uh, if you get something, you have to pay for something. Of course, uh, in this case, we are uh, not too correct and in all details uh, can simulate the acoustic um, uh, oscillations and acoustic waves inside the neutron star. But for uh, our goal, when we need to get the energy of explosion, which should be comparable with the um, observational data. It's not so important to treat uh, acoustic points very uh, accurately. So uh, here's an example of the grid which we use. And another, as I told you, we have rings which move uh, with the cartoon, which I start in a short time. Uh, first, every ring rotates uh, with its own velocity. And another point, we can follow uh, the collapse of the uh, matter in the central part of, of the star, where, the, as I told, uh, proton-neutron star of high density appears. And uh, we decided to apply all these points. Oh, no. I don't know why it doesn't work. Let me explain by words. Every ring rotates with its own velocity, and also we can concentrate or rarify the grid moving to the center or out of the center. So uh, actually, uh, in reality, we have a, a semi-Lagrangian grid, and we can follow the matter and using pretty, uh, the grid of pretty small velocity to resolve uh, with high uh, level of accuracy, resolve the uh, details of the flow here. So. Uh, uh, the uh, semi-implicit approach is, uh, in another word, is so-called Olmach number solver. Uh, in the case of uh, magnetorotational supernova, we have uh, flows with very low Mach number near the neutron star and very high Mach number or magnetic Mach number in the periphery when the uh, densities are not so high, but... Uh, uh, alpha velocity is uh, very uh, high. So, and uh, this is a standard system of uh, gas dynamic equations. The only point that this term in the energy of, in the uh, momentum equation, uh, gradient of pressure, and here this uh, member in the energy equation we take from the upper uh, uh, time level. So, uh, in principle, all these ideas uh, about which I told you uh, were suggested partially or in some details in different papers, but nobody up to now, at least as we know, uh, didn't use uh, all these details in one uh, approach, in one code. We made uh, different tests, for example, with uh, uh, decomposition or discontinuity or uh, sort test, just to show that in cylindrical and in spherical coordinates, there is no artifacts, no pro arti uh, numerical artifacts near the axis of rotation. So uh, it works pretty good. We made test, uh, so-called uh, dust test. Okay, thank you. Dust test, uh, you can see that uh, at the beginning, the density of the cloud was equal to one. And at the final point of calculations, it's uh, uh, more than 400. This is, of course, artificial uh, point. But uh, most uh, of uh, simulations, uh, almost practically all numerical simulations of dust problem get this uh, jump, small jump, and it's connected with boundary conditions. So uh, our uh, approach worked pretty well. Uh, uh, as I told you, differential rotation is treated by the uh, rotation of rings with its own velocity. And what is also important, usually people use, uh, of course, we all use uh, conservation law, mass, momentum, and energy. And in principle, if we uh, 
took uh, the momentum equation and multiply it by radius, then immediately in analytical form we get uh, the uh, um, angular momentum equation. But uh, in, in numerical approach, it's not equivalent uh, things. And if, even if you conserve the momentum uh, in phi direction, it doesn't mean that you conserve the angular momentum. Uh, because we have some additional terms in, uh, in numerical equation. So we decided to use, uh, and most important point in this kind of uh, uh, problems, to conserve angular momentum. So we, instead of momentum equation, solve the uh, equation for angular momentum in five direction. So uh, here is an example, example of a well-known kelvin gilgold stability test. Uh, we use semi-implicit and compare it with explicit approach and also we use uh, moving uh, mesh and non-moving mesh. Here is, uh, in these two plots, the mesh doesn't moving. This is semi-implicit and this is explicit uh, uh, approach and difference is not very big, Actually, almost it's the same. The only point that we have three times larger time step. I'm close to finish. But in the case of uh, uh, moving grid, we can get much higher resolution than in non-moving grid. But this is a, point, this is a, a situation when Mach number is 0.7. In, in the case when Mach number is very small, the explicit approach doesn't give at all uh, good results. But uh, here with big time step, we still get uh, good results. So uh, the same approach was applied to MHD equations. This is a standard set of MHD equations. Uh, the only important point that from the uh, stability condition, we remove the fast magnetosonic speed, which uh, also limits our uh, time step significantly. But we restrict it by uh, velocity of alphanic speed. In some cases, I must confess, uh, it's strict uh, uh, limitation when we have a very rarefied and very magnetized uh, matter, pretty far from the central parts. So this is a test of uh, magnetic blast. If no magnetic field, then the blast would be spherically symmetrical. But in the case due to uh, vertical magnetic field, it's pretty strong. You can see that the explosion goes uh, along this axis, uh, the uh, vertical axis, and we compare it with other results and uh, with other simulations, the results are pretty good. So I come to my conclusions. We develop and now applying the semi-implicit method on curvilinear coordinates, and it's extremely uh, handy for the differential rotating compressible flow. Stability condition is much less restrictive for low Mach number, while uh, if we have high Mach number, still uh, strong shocks and so on, <coughs> the, they are simulated pretty well. Well, uh, it's important to say that even if we use the explicit method, it also works well, but uh, in the case when we use uh, moving and differential rotating grid, then we still can get gain, get gain in productivity. So uh, all other questions we use, uh, we solve using Godunov type method, which are pretty popular in astrophysics. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, as, oh, sorry. Uh, the approach, the uh, numerical procedure, of course, could help to solve these kind of problems. The only important point, which additional physics 
besides uh, the uh, hydro and MHD is included in the uh, formulation of the problem. Of course, I didn't tell about, phys tell, tell about physics at all. We take into account neutrino transport, of course. Neutrino transport. It's important for supernova. But for... Of course, of course, I absolutely agree with you, and I didn't tell about this in this talk. In our simulations, we found magnetorotational instability, which uh, increase the magnetic field up to, uh, in our simulations, we have got up to something 3, 4 by 10 to the 14 Gauss's magnetic field. But uh, important point that the it's appeared in the, during the development of magnetorotational instability, and this is chaotic field. And this is maximal, the, these maximal values of magnetic field appears in pretty small volumes near the formation of the neutron star. As for power creation, we need very high temperatures. Uh, I'm not sure when, whether we reach these temperatures in supernova. For, for the method, it's just problem of the scales for the numerical procedure. Of course, important point, uh, even in supernova and in the case you are saying, is to take into account in any way relativity. Because uh, relativity processes here works uh, in all details. But uh, we can't do it in a simple way. We can't, uh, say, use... Uh, we can't use just uh, constant metrics and to solve simplified equations of general relativity. We have to solve uh, the changing metrics and all such stuff. It's, it's pretty difficult. It's possible. People do it. Shall I start? Yes. Yeah, I put here also. Okay, great. Uh, so, title is basically, okay, <laughs> title is uh, Magnetized Advective Accretion Jet Disk System and its Stability. I'll touch upon underlying theory first, then how it is supplemented by the uh, simulation and observation implication. Done with some of my present and past students, including Kausik, who is in Harvard now, working with Ramesh Narayan. And uh, let's see. So, recapping. So, we know that Sakura Sonia of Keplerian disk is one of the although fantastic model, but it requires amendment when you are trying to explain hard X-ray. And uh, even long back Cygna 6 one explanation required this hard X-ray component. And for that, you need advection, and uh, which explains this power lateral fantastically. Also, jets are observed from particularly X-ray binaries of black hole in the hard state, along with QPO sometimes. So advection also is required to explain jet. So that's why, why advection is important in my title. I was uh, trying to explain. As jet is also included in my first slide itself, 
leaking with advection. Let me also tell jet disk connection. We know that observationally, jet power is fantastically correlated with jet luminosity, starting from X-ray binary to blazer all the way when gamma ray bursts. On the other hand, radiation part of the jet power fantastically correlated with disk luminosity. That eventually tells that jet luminosity is correlated with accretion luminosity. That means if you are trying to understand jet appropriately, disk has to be modeled properly. Now, immediate question comes that the jet what I am talking about is uh, GR or Newtonian. Big debate, of course, uh, particularly when we know, uh, say, optical nebula, NGC 300S10, which has so powerful jet, 10 by 13 arcs per second, which cannot have GR. So, open people debate Blanford's Nike versus Blanford Pain or any other jet model. So, for the time being, as because my primary focus here, black hole accretion, I'll uh, look at GRMSD simulation in later part of the talk. So, basically, I'll consider this jet coupled model. So, the, in a glance that uh, complicated, a little bit complicated set of equations we'll be solving. Let me look at the cartoon diagram long back Chakravarti and Tita Chuk proposed non-magnetic version of uh, two component accretion flow. Two component because of the fact that far away from the black hole sitting here, central re middle region is Sakura Sunya Keplerian disk. If you go away from the central region, it becomes sub-Keplerian. And close to the black hole, this Keplerian region, middle part of temperature 10 to the 7 Kelvin at the most, disappears, giving puffy quasi-spherical region, which is uh, basically hard X-ray emitting region, which is the region for producing powerful jet, sometimes low frequency QPO, uh, with temperature sometimes 10 to the 10 Kelvin. And jet, is supposed to be produced from this uh, funnel wall like region. That is one of the models uh, Chakrabarti and Chuk proposed long back. But this is still non magnetic, as I said. We'll try to look at similar, in a similar platform, how introduction of magnetic field makes the situation more elegant. So, stability. I also had word stability in the, uh, the title. So, question is. Uh, what kind of stability, how stability is in our concern. So famous S plot, if I can recall, that accretion rate as a function of uh, column density, if I plot, Sakura Sunya disk, this region is stable. Abramovich strip slim disk is stable, radiation trap system. But in between accretion rate, you see, as accretion rate increases, density decreases. System becomes unstable because of strong cooling advective factor becomes negative. And uh, similarly, this is a high accretion regime. Low accretion regime has two branches. Very classic, original sapido lightman yearly uh, uh, track, which is secularly instable, unstable. But if you have advection, as proposed by subsequent authors, Ramesh Naran, Sandeep Chakraborty, and other colleagues, Mishnu Mati Gogan sitting here, uh, they showed by advection, actually, system could be stabilized. And uh, though some uh, demerits are also there, even Vishnubhati Gogan showed long back that the uh, problem is era. But over the years, people also modified with extra physics. And uh, so, but point is that although this is stable branch, this is unstable branch. But even in the stable branch, if you go beyond certain value of accretion rate, system again becomes unstable. Because again, strong cooling is making system apparently evacuated and system becomes unstable. We are going to show in next few slides that this unstable low accreting region above certain accretion rate becomes stable if you have introduction of magnetic field. Because magnetic field apparently brings in extra dissipation that takes care of advective factor positive. And, and of course, other branches I'm not going into in detail uh, due to paucity of time. All right, so now I'm telling magnetic field has to be introdu introduced to stabilize the disk. Question is, how strong magnetic field is expected to stabilize such a disk, which apparently is unstable at high accretion rate? Particularly when I say unstable at high accretion rate, again, I'm reminding you, low accreting system, which is apparently 
advective system. And advective system for general audience, again, I'm reminding, is the system which is helping to produce hard X-rays, which is our current interest, hard X-ray emitting accretion flow. Now, again, Cygnus X1, our one of the favorite uh, black hole sources, shows that from jet of the Cygnus X1 shows that footprint of the jet, which is actually uh, uh, disk uh, from the polarization, field could be as high as million gauss. And from simple flux freezing from the supply of the matter from sun like star, uh, is not difficult to explain this million gauss. If I extrapolate the extra binary based uh, 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 field estimation from Cygnus X1 to supermassive black hole, when we know magnetic field scales square root, with square root of density, which for the scales directly with accretion rate and inversely with mass, we, we can show that for same accretion rate in Eddington unit, for supermassive black hole, field will be 100 gauss. So all I'm trying to pose that the field I'm requiring, which eventually I'll introduce in my uh, uh, theory and simulation, is actually observationally viable. Fermi blazer actually is confirming this kind of field is possible, which I'll require for my input. So here, quickly, if I first theory, if I go into a simulation, three curves I am showing you with increasing accretion rate. Blue is having high accretion rate. Ne below dotted line means negative advection. Ne negative advection implies instability. Now, for this blue curve, if I want to increase magnetic field, it becomes positive. So basically, same story as I said, magnetic field brings extra, extra dissipation and that takes care of uh, positivity of the advection, and that way the system could be stable. Now with this, I'll go for full-scale numerical study, and I'll show some movie with strong magnetic field, which apparently people should have uh, thought that system could have been evaporated. But if you have a strong magnetic field, along with reasonably high accretion rate in the advective regime itself, producing hard X-ray, how? stable disk as well as jet is possible to produce. See, three different plasma beta I consider. Highest plasma beta means lowest magnetic field. Lowest plasma beta, highest magnetic field. See, white strips are basically field lines. First drag, matter is coming from far away. Matter is being dragged, flux freezing is there. And along with matter, flux is being, magnetic field is dragged in. As because magnetic field is dragged in, kind of barrier forms. Due to barrier, Finally, matter is being thrown out. That basically is the typical GRMHD simulation tells you. See, low beta regime, uh, the corresponding, you know, this arrow indicates the direction of the flow. Inward arrow means flow in, outward arrow means flow out. And uh, let me again uh, run. So, and bigger the arrow means larger the velocity. So again, you see, this low beta having ma maximum magnetic field, very powerful infall as well as outflow falls takes place. Because powerful infall is there, uh, but field is being dragged, more field is dragged, more st stronger uh, magnetic barrier forms, so more powerful ejection is taken place. You see, they are becoming calm now, quiet, but this is still very much vigorous, very much uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, and this is done for core parameter 0.93. And for this mass and accretion rate. Another 3D version of the movie, if I wanted to show. Again, GRMB simulation. I, this is not my, unlike previous one, which was my simulation. This is, I borrowed from my friend John McKinney. See? Torus, at the middle there is a torus, then that becomes flattened and matter, flattened means accretion, matter comes close to the black hole and then green lines are basically field lines and then matter is climbing up as blue region and jet forms. So this presumably Blanford's Nag mechanism based on primarily uh, super radiance then Penrose process and more precisely magnetic field is there, not pure Penrose process uh, doing this. Magnetic field is finally is helping to throw the matter out. And matter is energy is tapped from the black hole. Yeah. Thank you. So 
So basically, this is the quick, this uh, jet power is related to magnetic flux and uh, rotation of the system. It could be black hole rotation if it is ergosphere based in energy extraction, or if it is disk rotation if it is more like, more like uh, non GR power. So, last uh, one minute, a couple of minutes, I will basically show some interesting implication. ULX in hard state. So, we know that ULXs are the sources which mostly are argued to be either super red interactor or intermediate mass black hole. But when ULXs are showing powerful uh, hard X ray emission, then none of them will work. We require some advection, strong advection and low accreting system. So, these are the some ULX. A low accreting system, then only they are uh, exhibiting hard X ray, but luminosity is another 40 arcs per second. So, for that, basically, we do again that simulation. We consider three different magnetic fields close to the black hole, 10 to the 5 million, 10 million Gauss, and uh, we can see uh, uh, luminosity power. Luminosity basically, basically, here more of mechanical power for this current plot. You see, 10 to the 40 close to the black hole can be obtained, which could be done. Uh, which could be understood from the, uh, the movie I showed, spinning black hole with magnetic field. This also, uh, if I have cumulative luminosity, uh, you know, value could be further high. So, it is advective, hard state uh, system, but just because strong magnetic field and black hole spin together, uh, even hard state uh, activating system could be able to produce 10 to the 40 arcs per second. Well, I'll summarize. So basically, I try to understand that hard X-ray production, and I say that advection and magnetic field, both are necessary to understand advective accretion flow. Then launching a powerful jet requires not only magnetic field, perhaps GR, at least for a black hole X-ray binary, GR cannot be neglected. That explains hard X-rays. So moderately strong field stabilizes the disk at higher accretion rate, which otherwise is suffering from instability could be secular instability with negative advection, but uh, high accretion rate even in the moderately uh, strong magnetic field is viable for stabilizing. So basically I, I did briefly touched upon by GRMSD theory and simulation how magnetized field, magnetic field stabilizes advective sub Keplerian non-thermal accretion disk. Thank you. Yeah, no, it is going out of the black hole in the sense that matter is, first of all, I will tell what exactly is happening here. System is having frozen flux. So, uh, matter is coming from far away. As matter is coming, as flux is fro frozen, field is also coming along with matter. So, by the time matter comes close to the black hole, I have enormous magnetic field, which produces magnetic wall, magnetic barrier, and because Polaridal field by, by this time has become very high. So field lines are like this. So it produces wall. So matter comes, field is dragged, produces wall, and matter is kicked out. So that, that basically happens. Then once matter is able to pass through the field line, if some toroidal field is there, polar, if it's purely polaridal field, very, very difficult for matter to go into the black hole. But if you have pure polaridal field is not impossible, is not possible, some toroidal fraction will be there. And toroidal field can allow matter to flow in, then it will go into the black hole. So basically, going to the boundary condition, basically it is, I have far away matter coming, then it passed through sonic point, which is in the first place giving some effective boundary layer. Then uh, basically shock may also form, I am not very sure shock will be here. It is magnetosonic shock or uh, supersonic, I am not very sure. But basically, strong flux freezing is giving a lot of matter along with magnetic field accumulated that produces a wall. That is kind of effective boundary layer producing here.
Yeah, first of all, I do not agree that ADAF is requiring that is a minus five. I believe you've been adding to an acquisition, right? I don't think uh, uh, ADAF is requiring 10 to the minus uh, 5 Eddington as low as that. I would say anything 10 to the minus 2 Eddington or less would make ADAF. If you don't like the word ADAF, I would say REAF, relatively inefficient flow. And uh, for stability, as I showed you, that advective factor, you have to have two. One is dissipation, another is cooling. If feel, uh, matter supply is above certain value, then cooling will start dominating, and that will make Q uh, energy radiation higher. To make energy radiation, energy radiation you cannot control. To make energy radiation uh, suppress, or rather to make balance energy radiation with energy dissipation, if you have magnetic field and along with accretion rate high, then you have extra uh, dissipation. Again, that will make the advection factor greater than, uh, greater than zero. So basically, when I say instability in the first place, I mean the, uh, energy radiation is larger than energy dissipation. But uh, high accretion rate in high magnetic field, uh, high accretion rate, first of all, increases uh, radiation. But magnetic field, again, increases dissipation, making the advective factor again positive. That's the point. But uh, yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying here at this very interesting meeting in this so uh, very beautiful city. I'm sure you are enjoying also the city during this very interesting meeting. Thank you very much, Narek, for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about a topic which is almost the most recent uh, trend in black hole thermodynamics. It's called extended thermodynamics. So, uh, first of all, I am going to talk about homogeneous black hole, uh, homogeneous uh, systems. So, which is something very simple. We already know just from elementary physics. Then I am going to compare this, this uh, definition of homo homogeneous system with black hole thermodynamics. We are going to see if it doesn't work. So then I will compare black hole thermodynamics with quasi-homogeneous thermodynamics to see that it works. Then I will explain a little bit about, about the formalism we, are going, we are, have been developing for the last 10, 15 years, which is some relation between geometry and thermodynamics. And as a result of these formalism, we see that it is necessary to consider extended thermodynamics. So the idea is this, this is not just a funny way to look at thermodynamics, but it is something we should do always. I'm going to explain why. Okay. <clears throat> so, what's an homogeneous system in a standard uh, thermodynamics? Let's look at something very simple, which is the fundamental equation for the ideal gas. It's written in this way. This is entropy, internal energy, volume, and uh, number of particles. This is something we know very well. From here, we can obtain all the properties of the ideal gas. I mean all the properties, all the equations of state. So let's look at this transformation, the scaling transformation, in which we multiply each of the variables, which are here inside, by some constant lambda, and we see what happens. We see that this fundamental equation satisfies this very nice uh, relation, which means this fundamental equation is a homogeneous function. So we say that all the systems which, in which the uh, fundamental equation satisfy this equation are homogeneous systems. This is for an ideal gas. You can do exactly the same thing for a Van der Waals gas. You can do it for a decent model. For many systems you use, especially in chemistry, in the laboratory, 
everything is fine. All the systems we know in nature, especially in laboratory, laboratory satisfy these conditions. This is what we call ordinary thermodynamic system. And we say that a classical ordinary thermodynamics is homogeneous. So let's look at the same thing in the case of black holes. Let me take Einstein's theory. We, we know that the fundamental equation in this case is the bekenstein hopkins relation in which the entropy is one for the area of the horizon. So let's calculate this for the Kirk black hole. We know that in this case, the fundamental equation, so the entropy of the Kirk black hole is given in this form in terms of the mass and the angular momentum. So let's do exactly the same thing. Let's multiply each of the constants of the variables we have here inside mass and angular momentum by a constant, we will say it doesn't work. It is not homogeneous. It seems to be a very simple thing that people have been working with this. Not a problem, it's a funny thing. Okay, we say, okay, this is a very strange entropy. We know that usually entropy is proportional to the volume. And here we have something different. We have entropy which is proportional to the source of area. So it's why we talk about holographic entropy holographic thermodynamics, and so on. So the reason is that this relationship is really very, very strange. From the physical point of view, we don't understand it. We know that it works, but we don't understand it from the physical, physical point of view. OK, then we say, usually, that Kerr black hole, the Kerr black hole, and also black holes in any other theory, they are not homogeneous, non-homogeneous system. And that's it. We work with all of them. So now let me go into a a different, into, a, into a, a different situation. So let's take the same fundamental equation for the Kerr black hole. And let's make a different scaling, a different in the following sense. I take each of the, of the uh, variables we have inside this, this fundamental equation, m, I multiply it by lambda to the power beta m. I take also j, the angular momentum, and multiply it by lambda to the power beta j. OK? So we obtain this very uh, simple relationship. And we can see that this, this fundamental equation for a k black hole satisfies this condition. So it is proportional to lambda to some power, to new power, only if this condition is satisfied. These powers are related to this condition. So then we say that a, a, a function which satisfies this condition is called a quasi-homogeneous function. So then we can say that if this condition is satisfied, black holes are quasi-homogeneous system. And a very interesting thing that, that is derived from here is Euler's identity is exactly the same thing which we know as the SMART formula. Remember, the SMART formula is the relationship between the mass, temperature, entropy, uh, angular velocity, and the angular momentum of the black hole. So in that, this is a very nice thing because Euler's identity is a mathematical identity. And smart formula is a physical, it's a physical formula we get just by looking at the, at the parameters of a black hole. So this is, you can say, OK, we have an identity within something which is mathematical and something which is, which is physical. OK, it's a very nice coincidence, no, nothing more. OK, now let's go into geometry thermodynamics. This is a formalist which we have been developing for the last 10, 15 years, in which we explain thermodynamics in terms of geometric concepts. So we have some sort of, of, uh, of dictionary in which here we have a thermodynamic system, any, and to this thermodynamic system we can, we can uh, associate a Riemannian manifold, which we call an equilibrium space. Actually, each point of this equilibrium space is a possible state of equilibrium of the system. It's very simple. So this is Riemannian manifold. That means it has curvature. And we can show that if we have curvature from this here, this corresponds to thermodynamic interaction on the other side. If we have a singularity here at the level of the curvature, this corresponds to phase transitions at the level at, on, on the side of thermodynamics, and so on. There are several, so there is a correspondence between things we know, which are physical from the point of view of thermodynamics, they correspond to something here, which is pure geometry. This is what we call geometro thermodynamics. So we have been applying this formalism in black hole physics, in astrophysics, in cosmology. I will show you an, an example 
of, uh, of the application of GTD, we call this GTD in cosmology. So we had a, I would say it's a very small problem, which is not, not so nice. It was the following thing. When we are applying, remember, there, there are two, two types of systems, homogeneous and not homogeneous. So we decided if nature is like that, black holes are not homogeneous, so we have a particular formalism for homogeneous system and a different formalism, they are related, but a different formalism for all the remaining, uh, the, the remaining uh, uh, systems. So we were looking at the form, mathematical form of this formalism to see what else can we do in order to find only one formalism which unify these two systems from the mathematical point of view. But it, turn, it turns out that it is possible that both formalisms are exactly the same thing from the mathematical point of view if we assume that all the systems in nature, all of them, all of them are quasi-homogeneous. All thermodynamic systems in nature are quasi-homogeneous. So the consequence of that is that thermodynamics should be extended. So what we, what people began doing as a very nice example of application of thermodynamics in black hole physics, is nothing that is so, only very nice, but it's a necessity as a result of this unifying formalism in which all the, form, all the system should be quasi-homogeneous. So let me then look at the, at the, um, at this case in general. So then let's look in quite general terms at the definition of quasi-homogeneous functions. Is let's look at this very general function in which the entropy is given in terms of several, or depends on, on several uh, variables, E1 to En, and we do exactly the same what I explained before. We do a transformation in which this constant lambda is to some power, thank you, some power, and each of these power is different for each, each component, for each variable. So this is, and if this relationship is satisfied, we call it quasi-homogeneous condition. This means that all the systems which satisfy these conditions are quasi-homogeneous thermodynamic systems. So a particular case, and this is a nice thing here, is when all the powers, all the betas, are one, in that case we go back to homogeneous system. So this is very simple. So then let's suppose in nature all the systems we know are quasi-homogeneous, and in this particular it's a very simple case, we go back to a standard thermodynamics, ordinary thermodynamics. So then let's look at some generalizations of Einstein theory. Okay, now let's suppose that all the black holes are quasi-homogeneous. So let's, let's look at, a, at a Einstein theory with cosmological constants. We know that this is fundamental equation of the more general black hole. And in fact, if we do this transformation with these conditions, we know that this, this can be done only if we assume that the cosmological constant is a thermodynamic variable. This is very strange. This is very strange, in fact. But we know that from the mathematical point of view, it should be like that. So what happens from the physical point of view? Then we have to consider this constant, which is the, the cosmological constant as a thermodynamic variable. That means that the first law of black hole thermodynamics has to be added in this term. This is a new term. And the dual to the cosmological constant is the volume. This is why we now consider the cosmological constant as a pressure, like a negative pressure. So this kind of thermodynamics in which lambda is a thermodynamic variable is called extended thermodynamics, but also it's called black hole chemistry. This, what I called at the beginning, is one of the last trends in black hole thermodynamics. So let's do that with a different theory, uh, einstein gauss bonnet theory. This is the Lagrangian of this theory. Here we have the term with cosmological constant B, which is the gauss bonnet constant. Then we, we, have, we can do exactly the same thing for black holes. We'll see that lambda should be a, a, a thermodynamic variable B, and A in B also. Okay? So we go to black hole to extend the thermodynamics. We can do exactly the same thing in einstein maxwell lovelock theory. The coupling constants should be thermodynamic variables. This is the idea. Let me show you another example in cosmology. We call this geometrodynamic cosmology. We have a standard cosmology with the Freeman equations. 
We put here that we know from GTD, for different thermodynamics, and we build a new uh, type of cosmological model. This, in this model, we have four constants, and from this model, when we integrate all the, all the, uh, all the variables, then we obtain two types of universe. One is exactly exact, exact lambda CDM, so this contains lambda CDM. It contains also an inflationary model, which is different from the point of view of thermodynamics. So, conclusions. All, according to this, all the thermodynamic systems in nature are quasi homogeneous. The ordinary systems which we know in laboratory, they are just a particular case of this quasi homogeneous uh, condition. Classical thermodynamics should be always, always, especially in gravity, should always extended to include all the coupling constants of the near theory. They should be thermodynamic variables in order for the formulas to be complete from the mathematical point of view. In, in geometrodynamic cosmology, we use unified both formalism, general relativity, and geometrical thermodynamics, and we can build new cosmological models, which are cosmological models in the case of our universe. We can show that our universe is a homogeneous system, starting from inflation, before inflation. We believe, we cannot show that explicitly, but we believe that our universe is quasi homogeneous, and this is probably why the reason pre inflationary models are so complicated. Thank you very much. Uh, you mean well, in cosmology, so this one. This, this is the, well, we assume that our universe is a thermodynamic system. That, that means it has some internal energy, U, it has some volume, V, and that this is the relationship with the standard cosmological model. You see? So, and this is the entropy of the universe. So we assume that our universe is a, is a thermodynamic system. That's the idea. It, it, it has dust. In a particular case, look, there is a particular case in alpha and beta are equal to zero. We obtain just a barotropic equation of state. So it's exactly the same what we have in the standard cosmological model. So the, the, the content of the universe is the standard one. We can, well, the first question. Yes, we are talking, and this is the reason of the quasi homogeneity of a long range force. Gravity is a long range, uh, range force, and this is probably, we don't know that exactly, but we believe that is the reason why the Euler identity has, has to be changed in this uh, nice form in which only the coefficients uh, change. All the other things are the same, but the important thing is that the mathematics is the same with some uh, particular. Uh, changes, very, very small changes, but the physics is completely different. It's a long range uh, interaction, which is gravity. Okay, and what about the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
The idea is you take all the constants you see in your fundamental equation. Of course, I have here C, I have G, I have uh, the, the Boltzmann constant, I have everything. You do all the transformations you need until you find the minimal, the minimal uh, number of transformations you need in order to obtain this condition, the condition of quasi-homogeneity. You don't need to transform all of them in order to satisfy this, this condition. So C, you don't need to transform it. G, you don't need to transform. You transform all of them and then you, you eliminate one by one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for being here and for inviting me uh, in this meeting. So uh, this presentation we'll talk, uh, I'll be having here is just a proposition of what uh, we, we could do. And uh, the title is Probing Episodes of Phenomena Associated with uh, Naturally Produced GRB Using X-ray Free Electron uh, Lasers. So GRBs are, are, they can be considered like a natural uh, experiment uh, instrument. And uh, we'll, after we just briefly go over this one, we'll talk about the GRB related phenomena, which are uh, common to, to most of the audience here. And then we'll add some information about the free electron lasers and the X-ray free electron lasers. So GRBs, they are uh, energetic explosions that occur naturally in distant galaxies. And uh, their analysis, it helps or it facilitates the probing of early universe and its expansion, the understanding of stellar evolution, analysis of high energy phenomena and, uh, and the matter under extreme conditions. They constitute excellent natural labs, lab settings to test the fundamental physics theories and properties of matter at, uh, on matter radiation interaction. So GRBs, they were initially reported uh, by, uh, in 1973. They, some, some of their properties which are put in, the, in catalogs, they are the, well, the, uh, the spatial distribution across the sky is uh, isotropical. A uh, large amount of data is reported. Parameters that are recorded in tables in tabular form, they include the temporal structure, intensity, flux, energy spectra, peak power, burst morphology, coordinates of the source, and uh, some of the catalogs, they are here, some of the publications, they, the, actually, for some specific uh, observation during, uh, from September 78 uh, to uh, May 79, there was an observation frequency of one GRB in every two days. That was for one experimental uh, exper for one uh, experiment, which is shown here. For, uh, actually, that, uh, set, that data set was acquired, I think, with two, two uh, detectors to confirm the, the acquisition of the uh, signals. The experiments that could mimic the conditions in the outer galactic region, so, uh, so in the galactic regions, they include, well, they, they include the possible uh, radiation matter interaction at the core of massive stars, in supernovas, neutron stars, etc. And uh, the experiments that could mimic, mimic or complement the observations at the, at the natural laboratories is the study, study of matter at extreme conditions, uh, including high pressure, high temperature, uh, 
And then it could be the analysis of matter dynamics at the atomic and molecular level employing pump probe experiments on pulsed molecular supersonic beams. And pump probe, it would be a pump and probe using lasers, study of electronic structure of matter under high magnetic field, study of DNA mutations in order to test one uh, unique hypothesis, the GRB-associated radiation with optimal intensities at the sea level. These could lead to biodiversification, and this is a work uh, which was uh, put, uh, published in 2015 by Professor Rufin and his collaborator. And now, regarding this uh, specific uh, uh, hypothesis, which is mentioned here, uh, it is related to Cambrian explosion. This Cambrian explosion it happened around uh, 541 million years, and there was a rapid uh, period of rapid diversification, biodiversification, and emergence of complex life forms in fossil records. Prior to this uh, period, Cambrian uh, explosion, life was consisted of simple uh, and microscopic or organisms like bacteria and algae. Uh, fossil evidence re reveals this, and uh, it's noticed that the uh, remarkable diversity of uh, marine life was observed after this uh, specific period, which was around 541 million years. Now, factors that could have led to Cambrian explosion could be some of these, like uh, changes in the environment, emergence of new ecological niches, uh, evolution of genetic and developmental innovations, influence of, influence of predator-prey uh, interactions. And this is the new hypothesis, which uh, states that probably a GRB photons that could reach a seed level, and they could induce DNA mutation in organisms, which were protected by by some layer of water uh, or soil. Now, uh, could GRB-associated radiation induce DNA mutations? Well, uh, was the biodiversification triggered, triggered by, GR, uh, by uh, G, GRB? This was the publication. Now, the, the modeling of, of this uh, to, to evaluate this uh, probability or possibility of, of such a, an event, uh, it's, it's put uh, in, in, these, in these steps. So at uh, a time uh, less than five, Giga years, uh, short burst. So it, it, uh, the uh, expectation is a short burst could cause this one with, with an estimated event rate of uh, 1100 uh, gigaparsec cube, uh, inverse cube per, per year. The distance for such a short burst uh, GRB affecting Earth would be, uh, would be uh, at some distance of around 500 uh, parsecs. The composition of the atmosphere at, th at that time when the Cambrian explosion happened, it was, most of it was uh, N2. And the photon-atom interaction, there would be these three interactions here, uh, the photoionization, the content scattering at different energy levels, and the pair production. And the sea level, this, uh, this matter-radiation interaction would be more dominant. Now, similar episodes that are confirmed and hypothesized are actually, I, I can provide these two examples. There are, of course, some more. The first one is actually, it's, it's more like an hypothesis. Even the title of the, of the publication, which is uh, written by Basu and uh, Felix Mirabel, in 2009, they uh, predicted, they said that the, the new generation or next generation X-ray telescope could provide further insights whether the X-ray binaries could have heated the early universe. This was one of their uh, predictions. And then some results, some simulations that, again, the group of uh, Felix Mirabel included the uh, micro quasars. They could serve as a heating source of intergalactical medium during reionization. And this would be more effective near galaxies, and their effect was uh, uh, simulated or evaluated to be comparable with the effect of cosmic ray from supernova. Uh, this was, and now, uh, in line of, with these uh, confirmations and hypotheses on regarding the effect of the radiation from, a, uh, from a, probably from another galaxy to another uh, galaxy, this could be uh, equivalent to what the hypothesis of uh, having the biodiversification triggered by a GRB in our planet. Now, uh, to mimic the natural experiments in a lab, many effects can be studied in the lab. Uh, the data acquired in the Earth by the Earth orbiting satellite may be complemented. One of the best options could be the use of X-ray free electron lasers for some parameters that they do have. Uh, uh, FELS free electron lasers, they were developed by uh, John Meddy in the 70s. And recently, the FELS have been very successful. The, one of the positive examples is the X-ray FL, which is a European XFL in Hamburg. They have been producing excellent, excellent data over the last five years. I think the first results, they, they were in 2017, 2018, and they are uh, moving forward very, very, very fast. Now, both the GRB and XFLs involve high energy electromagnetic uh, radiation. They have similarities in the physical properties and applications. Uh, they both have application in astrophysics, material science. They can be used uh, so GRB does this in, at an excellent rate. 
uh, by analyzing the properties of matter. XFL can do this one also. XFLs they can operate in single shot or multiple shot mode as, as we want to operate them. Uh, experiments, it, can, it could include an analysis of matter at extreme pressure, temperature, high magnetic fields, uh, and we can, this can also be related to the analysis of matter radiation uh, interaction in the vicinity of black holes or in the aftermath of supernova explosions. Now, a good example of a research group that conducts a similar work would be the high energy density, which are uh, stationed in the European XFL. Regarding the XFL sources around the world, there are a couple of examples. The, uh, one of them is the uh, LINA co coherent light source at FLAC, which is a national, la national laboratory in California. They produce their, their parameters. In, uh, they have 120 X-ray pulses per second at the 50 femtosecond per second for each pulse. Uh, European XFL, they can produce up to 20, uh, 27,000 pulses per second. Now, uh, they have reported the results over the last uh, five years. Uh, they have reported experimentally that uh, now they can uh, conduct uh, experiment, experiments at highly integrated projects, so they can combine different uh, uh, options. Uh, a couple of, of uh, publications, they report the analysis of DNA where uh, of DNA using XFLs. Now, uh, we, we propose the analysis of DNA, so since XFLs, they can be done to, to do the, the diffraction analysis of the, of the DNA, we, could, we propose to do these measurements after the DNA has been interacting with the radiation in an invas invasive uh, mode, not uh, imaging non-invasive, but we want to be uh, invasive, such as uh, to cause some, uh, to, to measure the order of how long they can withstand, etc. cetera. So uh, these facilities of imaging, they exist, if we do the, also some uh, hypothetical damage or to analyze, we can do this one in the, in the XFLs. And uh, as a conclusion, this was a proposition work that could be conducted. So GRBs, they provide natural experimental conditions at high energy, temperature, pressure, magnetic fields. XFLs, they can mimic these experiments in a controllable man manner. Matter and DNA can be studied in, uh, in higher resolution under extreme conditions with the objective of evaluating hypotheses uh, one of them, a uh, hypothesis of the trigger of Cambrian uh, explosion. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I, I can make just a, a <coughs> statement. During uh, our visit to Algeria, we have the good pleasure to meet uh, uh, Oka.
we are sad, we are understanding the different views. But there must be a role why nature has developed geography, homogeneously, democratically, all over the world. And to me, it's extremely exciting, and I'm finished, that uh, uh, the expert is starting the DNA structure now. It would be fantastic if the geographist, the real goal is to create a DNA. I will give a, a lecture on this on the 12th of September at the best fair in Hamburg. And uh, eventually we will, uh, of course, I will be uh, pre uh, pre present, uh, we will go together. Mm -hmm. It's a great uh, new uh, exciting we will see if it goes, but it's worthwhile to look at this. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I, I am very happy that uh, we can collaborate with mm -hmm. this fantastic young scientist mm -hmm. Thanks. in a in new university. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our question. Oh, thank you. 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 I don't have pocket. Just keep in your hand. It's okay. Like this? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Mahishri from Indian Institute of Science. Today, I will talk about detection of isolated neutron star by a continuous gravitational wave. So, as I will mostly talk about detection of neutron stars, I should mention that there are various ways to detect neutron stars. First, uh, in, it comes in our mind that, okay, we can detect the neutron star which are pulsating by their pulsation. And Okay. Yeah. And of course, if uh, a neutron star is in a yeah. Oops. Am I not audible? Is this is not working. Okay. Is not a slide. Uh, so I was saying that as I will, as I will talk about uh, mostly the detection of neutron star, I should say that there are various ways to detect neutron stars. Firstly, of course, pulsar. Then, if a neutron star is in a accretion accretion uh, accreting system, then we can detect the system as X-ray source. And if the neutron star has another companion as neutron star or another black hole, then we can detect the gravitational wave from them. But what about uh, the neutron star which has no companion or has a very minimal electromagnetic counterpart? Then uh, we can detect those neutron stars via their continuous gravitational wave. Those neutron stars, if they have high magnetic field and if they are rotating, they will continuously emit uh, gravitational wave. So, uh, it is, we, know, we all know that neutron stars are generally born with mass around 1.6 solar mass. But some recent observations uh, have suggested that um, massive neutron stars 
which can uh, have more uh, mass than two solar mass exists. We will try to explain those massive neutron stars using high magnetic field and rotation, which will in turn lead them to produce continuous gravitational waves. So as I will uh, roam around um, uh, highly magnetized neutron star, I should maybe mention in one line how this uh, strong magnetic field was generated. So during core collapse, after flux freezing, because of alpha omega dynamo, this field, uh, the magnetic field can amplify up to 10 to the power 17 to 18 Gauss in the center. And so our aim in this project is uh, to simulate continuous gravitation wave from isolated neutron star and we will try to understand possible observation of them. I have already mentioned that it is very uh, normal to have a high magnetic field and rotation in a neutron star. Both of them independently deform the star. So along with this deformation, if the star has a misalignment between the rotation and magnetic axis, then this star may radiate continuous gravitational wave because this system will be triaxial and it will have time varying non-zero quadruple moment. So this misalignment is also very general because uh, neutron stars are generated via supernova events, which is a very random event. Now you can see here that the gravitational wave amplitude plus and cross, this takes, this is not, uh, I mean, this takes good material perhaps. And H0 is the gravitational wave uh, amplitude. H0, to calculate H0, I need the information about the star, such as mass, radius, uh, moment of inertia of, uh, their principal axis. So to have those information, I will, we, we will have to model the star. We will do so using publicly available code XMS, which is basically an Einstein equation solver in GRMHD. And this Einstein equation uh, solver will provide us axisymmetric equilibrium configuration with uniformly or differentially rotating system. We can uh, do that by modeling. And uh, we can also provide polyidal, toroidal, or mixed field kind of uh, magnetic field. So in order to have the output, we will have to provide some input, which are polytropic law, equation of state. And if we have differential rotation system, we will provide the profile. And we have to provide the magnetic field profile also, which is again a polytropic law. So now I will show some cases. And I will try to motivate you towards that, uh, that when I said the star will be deformed, you can see the star is deformed here because of magnetic field. So in this case, uh, th this profile has toroidal magnetic field and rotation. And you can see that the, the star looks kind of prolate in shape because of the magnetic pressure. And the magnetic uh, field is basically very high near the core. And it, it has a model and uh, it decays away near the equatorial radius. So the equatorial radius kind of looks like more spherical because there is a competition between centrifugal force and the force due to magnetic field. I'm going to the next slide. And because I have already shown toroidal magnetic field, then I will show polyidal magnetic field. Uh, structure. Now you can see the uh, neutral star looks like very much like a prolate in shape. It's also very well understood the, the magnetic field is like Earth's magnetic field. And that's why uh, the neutron star is now deformed into prolate shape. So I have shown you that the star is deformed be because of rotation and magnetic field. Now we will, uh, we have the information about the neutron star and we will try to uh, calculate the gravitational wave amplitude I have mentioned earlier. So uh, also, we have misalignment in the star, uh, which, is, uh, which is small. We have taken it's 3 degree. Now, I am showing you the sensitivity plots of various detectors. And above them, I have plotted those two stars, which I have modeled. And you can see that those, those two stars, as they lie above the sensitivity curve, they should be detectable by advanced LIGO, advanced Virgo, and Kagra. However, till today, till this day, we have not detected any continuous gravitational wave from any neutron star. So we will try to understand what is the reason. Actually, the gravitational wave strain is a function of rotational frequency, obliquity angle, and magnetic field strength. When all, actually all three of them decays with time, so gravitational wave strength also decays with time. So we should try to understand in which time scale we can see those neutron stars before they have decayed away below the sensitivity curve. Uh, actually, the uh, spin, uh, rotation frequency, and obliquity angle uh, decays because of the angular momentum extraction from the system because of electromagnetic and gravitational wave radiation. Also, there is a very early effect, viscous and thermal effect, which happens in very early stage. And in long run, they really does not 
uh, that really does not change the system much. Also, in a realistic fluid system, there is magnetic field, there is current. We will have ohmic dissipation, ambipolar diffusion, and Hall drift. Because of that, we will have magnetic field decay. In next couple of slides, I will uh, I will uh, show you how these two effects independently decay the uh, gravitational wave amplitude, and then we will decide that which of these effects are more, more efficient. So first, this is the angular uh, this is the angular momentum extraction from the system. This is a toroidal magnetic field model. I will tell you later why I have first shown you the toroidal magnetic field model. So you can see here the decay happens in five years of time scale, and here you can see that uh, that this uh, neutron star is actually uh, detectable, will be detectable by Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer after just its birth, but after five years of time, it will not be detectable by any of the detectors. So as I mentioned that I have shown here toroidal magnetic field dominated profile and decay. So if the star has a high colloidal magnetic field, the electromagnetic decay will be very high. So this system will decay the energy, the angular momentum or the uh, rotation the period, etc. in very small time, let's say few days of time. But actually to have a stable neutron star structure, we need a toroidal dominated profile. So this picture is according to me is the important one. Next, we will talk about the magnetic field decay and because of that, how uh, the gravitational wave amplitude decays. Uh, you can see in the left, si left side, this is a, a toroidally dominated profile and in the right side is a polyidally uh, dominated profile and it decays with time, which is 10 to the power 5 year. Again, 10 to the power 5 year, which is much, much larger than that 5 year. Okay, uh, so you can see the similar thing happens here. The neutron star which was detectable, which can be detectable, it will not be detectable after 10 to the power 5 years of time scale. So to summarize, uh, the time scale for uh, rotation period or uh, decay is very, very less than that of the time scale for magnetic field decay. So actually the dominant uh, decay mechanism here is this. Because of that, the gravitational wave amplitude decays faster. So this is most important in our case. Uh, I have probably convinced you that it is very hard to detect the continuous gravitational wave for various decay mechanism uh, for the neutron stars, but uh, still we will try to increase the detection possibility by calculating signal to noise ratio for one year of integration time scale. So that in future, when and if we, are, we will be able to detect the neutron stars by future detectors, we can do the mission in a proper way. So uh, you can see here, for a particular model I have chosen, the neutron star which will not be detectable by any of the detectors just instantaneously, but after six months of integration time scale, you, uh, one will be able to detect the neutron star uh, by cosmic explorer. Why I am saying this? Because this is the threshold signal to noise ratio. When you stack your signal and sum it over, it increases a bit and it goes to saturation level. So when it goes above your threshold, means you can detect it. So to conclude my uh, our work, uh, highly magnetized uh, neutron star which are observed like massive as two solar mass can be explained by high magnetic field and rotation. Then uh, because we have not detected any of such events by LIGO Virgo, and possibly the reason is magnetic field decay and the extraction of angular momentum from the system. And uh, we have calculated all those decay, me decay mechanism together for the first time. So we will, however, it is not detected yet. However, we will try to increase the detection possibility uh, by calculating the signal to noise ratio for a stacked over time scale. Now, I was not able to mention that uh, the differentially rotating neutron stars case in this uh, work, which I have also done. Uh, which we have also done, uh, but I will mention it here a bit. Uh, so actually when the neutron star is generated, created from a supernova event, uh, it, is actually, it should actually differentiate, rotate differentially, not as a rigid body. So if it rotates differentially and it has a seed or weak polyidal magnetic field, the system should become a, a less massive and uniformly rotating system because of Alvin wave propagation and etc., which happens in very small time scale, like 10, 10 uh, seconds. Why I'm mentioning this is the uh, massive neutron stars, which may be a candidate at the first for the uh, 
for the two solar mass cases might not remain as massive as that, let us say after 10 seconds. So, no point of discussing uh, differentially rotating neutron stars. So, uh, there is hope. Uh, in future, we should uh, we should plan such uh, we should plan such missions with Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer, in which we can uh, detect those continuous gravitation wave instantaneously or after one year of integration time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I have one slide for that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The electromagnetic field is part one. This is your stress and energy moment So it is. It is actually not written there. It is only TV unit is written there. Uh, so. You, you have a strong magnetic field. Oh, how strong magnetic field? You mean? So, Yes, actually, uh, the magnetic field is inside this B mu B mu. B is actually uh, capital B by 8 pi scaled. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, ah, we will discuss about that later. I, okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, microphone. yes, please. Don't forget to please. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, should you talk to me? Thank you.
Shall we wait for Professor Rebo or shall we wait for Professor Rufini or of course? Okay. Just getting prepared. I think you have to prepare. Okay. How much I know is outside. This is G4, version 4. this one. So uh, it's nice to be here again. So the title of this presentation is The Revival of Descartes-Leibniz Debate as a Guide for Unification Theory by Removing Singularities. Now, this presentation, we could uh, present it in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, we thought that uh, a keyword can also serve to, to have a, a unique approach. So 
the, the outline. I'll spend a single slide talking, just uh, saying a couple of words regarding the Descartes Leibniz de, uh, debate. Then uh, I'll present uh, the two forms of expressions of energy that allow the transformation of the energy in a, in a system. Uh, I will define these and we'll use a new formulation of the energy to derive the equations of motion. And uh, we'll also present the use of spotted parameters associated with an object to derive parameters associated with an object. Now, the descartes leibniz debate, it, 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 uh, it went around 200 years in order to, to uh, analyze the theory or the statement, the thesis of Descartes on the qu constant quantity of motion and he coined it as MV. So he thought that the constant of motion in scattering expressions mostly it would be MV. Leibniz, he, he agreed on the statement. He said, okay, this, we should be looking for a constant of motion, but it's not MV, it should be MV squared. Because in free fall uh, experiments, he was noticing that something which is proportional to the mass and proportional to the V square is a constant. So, but Leibniz said, okay, it should be a constant, but most probably it's not MV. Actually, he was very harsh on it. What is interesting is that they both, during those uh, 50 years of debate, they both called this a force, but that's another topic. They called, both called the force, one equally to MV, the other MV. Leibniz was correct, quali correct qualitatively, but not, not correct quantitatively because the, the exact expression is MV squared over two, which is equal to the potential energy. MGH is, is equal to MV squared over two. So this is what Leibniz called this a transformation. The key word we could use that we thought to, pro to present this work here is a transformation. Now the steps employed in this work is that we first assume that the energy of an object is constant, is independent of the object's speed and form of motion. A field can be associated with an object. This is uh, something we, uh, it's, we uh, widely accepted. Every object has also a pair of space-time parameters with a quantum character, which we can evaluate. Actually, I can, we can say it from now, these two spotted parameters, they can be considered the, the gravitational radius and the classical radius. So these two uh, uh, parameters. And using these space-time parameters, we calculate all the uh, parameters of an object, including the field that it possesses. Now, the energies we define are shown here. The total energy, which is uh, assumed to be constant, is mc squared. We have an unexpo unexposed energy. This unexposed energy is just a statement saying that at velocity equal to zero, this, the whole energy of an object, it is uh, of uh, uh, potential, uh, potential character. Uh, as the velocity increases, this, uh, uh, this energy minus this is equal to the exposed energy, which has a kinetic character. And that's why we call this one the keyword of the transformation of the energy from the potential character to the uh, kinetic character. Now, every object has this. Uh, so this is what we, what we define. And actually, uh, so the exposed energy, it has kinetic character, is experimentally measurable. Unexposed energy has a potential character, internal energy is not experimentally measurable. And at this point, we could denote this one something equivalent to the dark matter, dark energy, which is unmeasurable in the masses around the, the, the galaxies. So this could be an interpretation of this unexposed uh, uh, energy. Now, in classical physics, we, we, have, uh, we have this picture where the velocity and the kinetic energy, it changes like this. There is no limit on the velocity. There is no limit in the total amount of kinetic energy here in Einstein's formulation of special relativity. We have a limit in the velocity, no limit in the kinetic energy. Now, in this picture that we propose here, uh, where the energy transforms from the uh, decreasing unexposed energy, uh, like which decreases with velocity, and it increases, which is the one with kinetic uh, energy or kinetic character. Now, everything uh, that we can analyze regarding the motion, uh, it occurs within these, these limits of energy and limits of, uh, of velocities. Now, the new model, can, it helps us to derive the equations of motions for both classical and relativistic physics. Now, here we have a representation of these graphs. So, uh, uh, Einstein set the upper limit of classical physics where actually this exposed energy, the expression which will be shown in the next slide, at low uh, velocities, it's equal to the kinetic energy, mv squared over two. And this is a limit for the classical physics. Later on, we have another limit at this intersection point, which has uh, interesting uh, properties. Now, the, the exposed energy is, in fact, this term. This, we can insert this one in the Lagrangian. And in fact, uh, in, uh, in textbooks, sometimes the Lagrangian in, in relativistic physics is an expression which has this negative term. It's minus the square root of mc squared. If this, this one has commonly uh, features of kinetic character, uh, kinetic energy with a negative sign could be observed with a slight doubt. And uh, actually this formulation, which has also some, uh, some reasoning behind it, 
could be a, 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 a unique approach. And also, the, the derivative of the ex, uh, exposed energy with velocity is equal to the relativistic momentum. Then the derivative of this, this expression will be the force, and from here we can find the, using this Lagrangian, and this is valid both for relativistic and for uh, classical uh, physics, because this expression uh, converges to mv squared over uh, 2. Now, uh, we have, uh, now the problem that can be uh, observed here is that at, uh, at the boundaries, or when the velocity is equal to zero or equal to c, we have some, some problems that we could not solve. And this one, what we use, we, we assume that when the velocity is zero, the exposed energy, which has a kinetic character, is zero. But the, uh, the energy which is maximum, which is equal to mc squared, has a potential character. It could be either gravitational potential or electrostatic potential, like this. And then we can say, uh, we can say that we can pick up the, 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 uh, the potential which has an uh, electrostatic potential, and we can write it like this. Then if we sub from this expression, if we substitute, if we divide by C both sides of the equation, we, and we, if we substitute that E squared over C is equal to AH, we get this expression. MCR is equal to alpha H. Alpha is a, a fine structure constant. For electron, from this expression, we get a value around 10 to the power minus 15 meters which is often uh, considered to be 100 times smaller than the Compton uh, radius. Uh, Compton radius 10 to the power minus 13. We observe that radius very often in the Compton scattering, where the difference in the wavelength of the photons is equal to the Compton radius of the, uh, of the electron. The classical one with this expression 10 to the power minus 15. And uh, we move ahead. Now, uh, what we do here is that, so we use this expression uh, to define this uh, R, and actually, uh, this R and T, R is the radius, T would be R over speed of light, that can be associated to the energy state of an object. Uh, then this R minimum and R max would be equivalent to classical radius and gravitational uh, radius. Now, uh, these radius that we find, they have a quantum character, they are not always experimentally measurable, they can be used to, uh, to parameterize the energy levels of, uh, of, a, uh, of a particle. And sometimes these values can match with the experimentally measurables. Now, regarding the, the classical uh, wavelength and the gravitational uh, radius, they would correspond to the classical radius of the electron, which is 10 to the power minus 15, which is observed in scattering experiments. And the gravitational radius, it matches with, the spa, with these parameters for the black hole. So if we use these equations of MCR is equal to alpha H, that would correspond to the radius of a black hole. These are two unique conditions which could make possible to extrapolate results from black hole to an electron in unique conditions, because uh, we could have a matching between these, uh, these parameters. And uh, so, uh, so at some critical masses, this radio can, uh, can match. Now, uh, these expressions, actually the MCR is equal to H. It's often used to calculate ranges of forces as a function of the mass of the field carrier. For example, in the pion exchange, a non-zero pion mass can be produced the mass times c squared would give an energy, so this is the mass of the pion. Then uh, once we find this delta energy, we find the delta t, which is the time that this particle is going to survive during the interaction. If we multiply this delta t with the speed of light, which is this c, we get an r, and this r is in fact, this number is equal to the range of the interaction. So this interaction, which is an, uh, enabled by the exchange of a pion, has this range. So actually this equation, mcr is equal to uh, h, we use for uh, in particle physics to evaluate uh, the uh, range of, of forces. Now, this MCR is equal to H, as we mentioned before. We can consider recalibration MCR is equal to alpha H, and we, we uh, propose to derive this one as you saw two, two, two slides before. The reason we, we uh, uh, consider to use this alpha is that this allows us to use this with a single mechanism to consider the spatial uh, radii or radiuses for both masses smaller than the critical mass and sm masses that are larger than the critical mass. This critical mass is proportional, or it's, uh, in the, it's the Planck's mass, in fact. And then Planck's mass times, uh, so Planck's mass times the speed of light, it's, ar it's around one, it's in fact one over two pi. And what happens is that the gravitational radius and the classical radius for the Planck's mass, they are both equal. So at this specific mass, which would be in the boundary around here, there is some uh, interesting features. So uh, this one, uh, this provides a classical radius for the small mass, which was shown in the two, three slides before for the electron. This one, interestingly, 
This produces the gravitational radius for heavy objects, so for planet Earth, black holes, etc. If we insert here the mass of a black hole, this radius will be the, the Schwarzschild radius. But we present it like this. As we said, uh, this model can, uh, uh, can shed some light in the way that we deal with this uh, radii. Uh, so we also assume that once we find some radius uh, associated with, the, with a particle, we can find, uh, we can parameterize, and we can say that the strength of the force times this radius would be equal to mc squared. Now, the maximum force for any object of mass m would, uh, would be maximum at the, at the length scale equal to the Planck's uh, length scale, in 10 to the power minus uh, 34 uh, meters. Now, here we show the graphs of uh, uh, logarithmic of the radius log mass. So here we have the mass of the electron. Here we have the mass of the universe. This would be the slopes that uh, we observe. Now, uh, this is again... So this is the graph was shown in the previous slide. Here, what we can, so these are log force as a function of logarithmic mass, again, parameterizing a lot of results. So again, we, and what we use is that if we find the maximum force with the equations which were shown in the table two slides before, uh, we can use the reduction of the force, which, is, which decreases with one over distance square. So for, maximum force is uh, exhibited when the distance is uh, Planck's length uh, square, and the force at a specific uh, distance, r, can be parameterized like this. And uh, if we set here for r equal to one meter, we can easily calculate and compare uh, different results. These numbers that we show here, actually in red, this is the, uh, the force which corresponds to the force between two masses of one kilogram of a distance of one meter, and the two masses of one kilogram at a distance of one meter, we find the gravitational constant. This is what we, uh, uh, what we find. Actually, here we show the numbers. Here, this is the finding the force of two objects with a mass one at a distance of one meter. This is what we find. This is the gravitational constant. Then we can try to identify the force between two electrons, and this is what we find, and this is really the force, and we are using just the mass and the spatial parameters and parameterizing the strength of the force at the Planck's width length scale and decreasing them. So this is an example of, again, uh, gravitational force, where we have the gravitational constant. This is the electrostatic force between two electrons or two protons. This is also the same that, that we know. One thing that we can add here is that here we don't use the gravitational constant and we don't use the electron charge. This is just a force which parameterizes itself, depends on the mass of the electron itself. So that's, uh, that's uh, this uh, approach. And now uh, an interesting result is also the fact that the, the, this spotted parameters of uh, gravitational radius and the uh, classical radius, the product of these two is equal to Planck's length scale uh, square. Now, uh, here we show that, uh, for example, this is a critical mass around the Planck's uh, mass. We, using this equation, we find this radius maximum, radius minimum. The product of this column with this column is equal to Planck's length scales uh, here. Uh, the square of this one is equal to the product of these two columns. And with this equation, which can help us to find a gravitational radius, this is Earth, Sun, Universe. This would be the, the uh, Schwarzschild radiuses for these, which, uh, we can, which are something that uh, we accept. Now, results that confirm the used approach that we presented here, we eliminate, the, not eliminate, but we, we can find the forces without using the gravitational constant. We can evaluate the forces between two charges, two elementary particles, without using the Coulomb's constant. And uh, we also showed here how we can find the acceleration on the Earth's surface, uh, the same way that we found the force between two, two uh, objects. Now, this is, again, a picture that we saw before. So uh, we had the limit of the of classical physics, which is valid for small velocities. Here, then we have another boundary, which is when the exposed energy is equal to unexposed energy. And this point is at square, square root of 3 over 2. This is actually the point when A is equal to 1, which is the maximum speed that a black hole can, can uh, rotate. So beyond this specific uh, critical point, which is uh, dictated or we, it can educate us how, where to find this boundary, uh, this one uh, corresponds to the, let's say, the maximum rotational speed. And beyond this one, we get this uh, naked singularity for the observed uh, black holes. As a conclusion, uh, we just chose to, to approach this problem uh, of the old debate two-century-long debate with a focus on transformation of, of motion or transformation of energy. 
And the, our approach here, it was to transform the energy from the exposed energy to the unexposed or from the energy with, with a, a potential character to the energy with kinetic character, which could account for the missing mass that we cannot experimentally observe in experiments. We introduced the concept of, expo, uh, of Lagrangian formalism. We revisited it. We saw how we define the space parameters. We gave the expressions that can be used to calculate space parameters, which exhibit an inversion and a, at a mass analogous to the Planck's mass. So these parameters, they have a, 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 an inversion at a specific value uh, because what can happen is that an example is that for electron, the gravitational mass of an electron would be traditionally be 10 to the power minus 57 meters, which does not uh, represent a physical reality, but it would rather represent a, a quantum character or just a, a parameter. Now, this is uh, all I wanted to say, and I want to thank you for the thank attention. You. Okay, okay, yes, thank you, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. More questions or comments? Thank you, John. Uh, if not, thank you very much. Okay, Dave, thanks.
Narlex produced an animal circle, and uh, of course, uh, Gregory, and uh, thank uh, everyone by women. Ես այր անցը մագային նորդ